Hello and welcome back to the Go Cave podcast. Our guest today has been a local pro in Southern Ontario and Quebec for years and is known for his technical style of riding. Not only has Stephen Moxley shown us some of the most technical foot jam combos in BMX, but he is well known for his big moves that he tends to pull out at the Toronto BMX Jam, like the whip to Fufanu on the back rail at the Toronto BMX Jam in 2017. On top of all of that, Stephen was also part of Cirque du Soleil Volta shows and showed a different side of BMX to the world. Stephen Moxley, dude, thank you so much. How are you doing today? My internet is wild. Uh, I'm doing great today. <laughs> there we go. It's like normally that happens like halfway through. So uh, to get it out at the beginning, that's perfect. Um, yeah, hopefully it just stays solid now. Yeah, there we go. Anyways, yeah, as I was saying, you know, you know, before we started the show, we were talking a little bit about uh, why I kind of wanted you on the show. And I didn't really dive too deep into it. But basically for yourself, you know, when I first started riding BMX, I was watching videos on YouTube and I remember seeing this video on Eric's ramp and it's like a green kind of half pipe setup and there's yeah. a hip and whatnot. There's a video of you riding there just with the most technical combos ever. And this was like 11, <laughs> 12 years ago. I just remember being... It's been a long time. <laughs> I was going to say, I remember being so blown away by all of these tricks and everything that you were doing there. But uh, yeah, ever since then, man, I wanted to meet you. And uh, I think I did a few years ago. I used to work at All In, so I know you came out to one of the contests then. And uh, yeah, man, it's finally good to be sitting down and speaking with you, though. Yeah, it's super cool. I mean, I remember you from the All In, and then I also know that you worked with Jordan, ramp building and stuff. So I know you've been around the scene for a bit as well. So it's cool to have another person that knows a lot of the same people and a lot of what was going on in that area. Definitely, man. Jordan's, uh, he's something else, man. I love Jordan. He's seriously yeah. like the hardest working dude on the fucking planet. Oh, absolutely. Nobody even comes close to what that dude, when he puts his mind to wanting to do something, it's just boom, boom, boom to the end of time, you know? Absolutely, man. By far one of the smartest people in BMX in my mind, you know? He's just so absolutely. brilliant. Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. Anyways, um, you actually have listened to the show before, so you know how we start this off. We go all the yeah. way back to when you first started riding. So uh, yeah. tell us about where you got started. Obviously, you know, you've been Toronto local for most of your life, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Toronto area, the Durham region. Uh, officially, that's where BMX started for me. It was actually in Ajax, Ontario. Uh, I was a 15 year old kid at the time, kind of just like didn't know what was up with life fully still. Uh, and my town built a skate park on the side of town I lived in. And that was just like the, the key thing. 15 years old saw it was like, I want to do this. And I remember seeing one person do a bunny hop over a rail to fakie. And that was it. I was like, I want to figure out how to do that thing. Mm -hmm. Damn, that's wild. A hop over a rail to fakie. That's pretty sick, actually. That's that's it. It's probably a foot tall rail on a like a mellow flat bank prefab park like the most basic of basic, but something about that just triggered my mind to go, that's so cool. That is, man. That's actually, uh, dude, that's a pretty cool trick, especially if you can like throw variations in there too, you know, a good bar yeah. spin over it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, back in that time, I mean, we're looking at now, I just turned 33 uh, the other day. So that's going, I can't believe it's been this long now. It's been 18 years of my life that I'm riding BMX. I always tell people like, oh yeah, I've been riding 11, 12 years. And I go, wait, you're 33, dude. You started when you were 15. Like, it's been a long time. Dude, I get the same way where I'm like, yeah, I've been riding for like, you know, five, six years. And then I was just looking at uh, my Facebook memories. And I'm like, I was getting into BMX like 10 years ago today, you it's, know, it's wild. huh? It's it, time, especially now, especially as we get older, it just like it snap, snap, snap. You're like, oh, it's the new year. I'm another year older crap where did it like i i enjoyed it but where did it go you know dude i don't know if you get the same way but uh i always kind of remember the years just through the tricks that i pulled that year you know like <laughs> filming and whatnot for you i feel like it's got to be something similar i'm not actually as good funny enough chris silva he was always that dude he knew exactly the date pinpoint to when he learned something and i've always just been kind of like, even some of your questions that i know you're gonna ask i'm like I don't remember the year that happened. Like it just sort of, I've always just let it flow, you know, like there's certain moments that I remember like when I started riding my first like favorite trick type of stuff, but everything else beyond that is just kind of been this flow state. It's always been a flow state. 
Definitely. And, uh, you know, normally we talk a little bit about the bikes that we had when we first started riding. So <laughs> for you, do you remember? Uh, I remember my original bike, like the first bike that my grandparents bought me was funny enough. It was too small. First of all, it had a 19 inch top tube uh, and it was a diamondback grind with a one piece crank on it. Decent. <laughs> and there, there's something you can say that shows my age right away. I said a one piece crank. A kid has no idea what that even is now. Dude, I had a very similar bike. I bought my bike for like $60 <laughs> and it was a diamond back and it also had a one piece Amazing. crank on it. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Dude, it's wild to think about, but most bikes nowadays, you know, if you're a kid, you can go out and spend six, seven hundred bucks Canadian on a brand new bike that has four pegs, coaster, no brakes, you know, the trendiest bike out there for that cheap, you know? It's, and like, it's wild. It's absolutely wild. I can't even understand. Like, I don't follow it the same way I did once when I was younger. Obviously, I, I'm not that enthralled by it. You know, I'm like, my bike works. I change out a part here and there because I'm still with younger kids a lot, especially through the circus. The dudes I ride with are usually about 10 years younger than I am. So they are the ones who kind of tell me about stuff. But I'm like, man, a kid nowadays, he has no idea what a, a crappy bike is. No clue. <laughs> Definitely not. It's uh, It's funny, right? Like, you'd go to the park and every day you'd have some sort of issue with your bike you know oh, i feel like or kids... on the way to the park <laughs> yeah <laughs> i remember bunny hopping bunny hopping up the curb to get into the park and my one piece crank fell off like it just oh my it was god done. and i was like uh <laughs> so do i get to ride today i at least had an older friend who had a lot of spare parts and stuff so he got me a crank to be able to ride but it was like nobody's gonna have that now nobody's gonna go to the park and their crank's just gonna fall off yeah. You know, like it's it's a whole new world with the way technology is gone, whether it's, you know, the Internet or the BMX industry. It is tenfold what it once was. Right. Definitely, dude. It's uh, it's pretty wild to think about, like, how much bikes have evolved. And, you know, obviously, right. Look at the riding. The riding nowadays yeah. is ridiculous compared to what it was 20 years ago. Absolutely. And then you then you can kind of break it down and respect even more what they did 10 years ago, because you're like, man, you did that with that bike <laughs> yeah dude i was talking to uh someone recently i think it might have been brian vowell just about like yeah. dude think about how those bikes were back then and i was like could you imagine if you had the bikes that you had like you have now but yeah 10 15 years ago like what would even be possible then right because I, I, yeah. I fully question it because it's it, it was mind-blowing what they could come up with what what they had really like how much further could they have all gone, you know? Yeah, definitely, dude. That's uh, that's pretty wild. Anyways, you know, we'll go back to here with you with <laughs> Ajax, right? You know, you were a, yeah. a local around there and whatnot, prefab park to start out. When you first yeah. really got into riding, who were some of the riders that you really looked up to? I feel like they had to be some park names because your riding is just <laughs> so technical, you know? Uh, obviously we had like the original McNeil DVD that had come out at the time of me and my first initial, like few years of riding. So all of that team, obviously you had Alistair, you had Ruben, like they all played a huge role, but the name that'll never leave my brain and I will know forever is Danny Hickerson. He Dude. is the reason that I ride the way I ride. And the reason I will always ride sort of that technical flat ground dish to hop trucks, hop tail whips. The fact that that dude did it all so far back when it was like so unheard of at the time and he would switch his feet and do it the other way like that. I mean, he's he will always be my favorite rider based on that. And I think that's what kind of molded me specifically into the rider I became. And then I just kind of took a little bit of that and, and kind of put, you know, a little bit of here, a little bit of there with each other person I would keep watching because I was obsessed with having as many magazines as I could watch as many VHSs, not DVDs, kids, VHSs as I could, you know, they're like to just see what everybody was doing and kind of like build who I am from all of it, you know, wild, man. I was going to say, <laughs> dude, Danny Hickerson is the fucking man. <laughs> Absolutely. There's some footage of him. I think it was 2005 Metro Jam, but I was just doing a live stream on my Instagram the other day, yeah. just watching old footage from then. And uh, there's this clip of Danny Hickerson doing a crank flip to downside, downside ice, ice on yeah, a quarter. I was there. Yeah, I was there in the audience. It was 
amazing dude i can't even like fathom how that works right and it's just so funny because when he does it you actually have to like watch the clip two or three times to really catch it because he just flips yeah. those cranks so quick uh, and then just so instantly quick. yeah it yeah. makes it yeah <laughs> he he was on another he was on another level really when it came to that that type of technical riding you know everybody was there was technical riding happening but he kind of almost merged this whole new kind of technical you know it was that that more hop trick but quick stuff like you say that crank flip was so fast you really have to go like hey did he actually crank flip there or was it just a downside ice like I'm not sure you know. Yeah, man, he's uh, he's seriously a legend. That guy is so underrated. He should have been, yeah. you know, the top dude at one point. Like, Abs absolutely. I, I feel bad that the, he had what happened to. I mean, he busted up his back real bad, and yeah. that's what kind of like just pulled him out of riding. And now, as I'm getting older and I have like some bulging discs in my back, I'm like, oh, I know what he felt back then. You know, like at first I was like, oh, where'd Danny go? Because like that's who I always aspired to be. You know. Yeah, absolutely, man. And something I want to mention just about injuries in general is that everybody's injury happens in a different way. Therefore, it's going to be a different kind of injury, right? Just because yeah. you break your leg and also Chester Blacksmith did, you yeah. know, doesn't mean that the situation is the same, right? Like, no, exactly. Yeah, sometimes, uh, I don't know, I hear a lot of people complain about like back stuff and BMX. And that's just a normal thing, right? Like, yeah, look yeah. at the way that we're stanced on our bikes. And even nowadays, yeah. you know, we are a lot straighter with our backs than we were 15 years ago. <laughs> when I started? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely, man. Um, anyways, you know, let's jump into a little bit of uh, some, you know, sponsorship stuff and whatnot over the years. So, how long were you riding until you went into your first uh, like contest or got your first sponsor? Because I know in 2007, you went to Metro Jam, and that was your first contest ever, right? Yeah, that was the, the excuse me, it was the first not-so-Metro Jam. So it was just after Jamie Aron and them had all pulled out because of, obviously, money and other things. So it was the original, not the, what we called the not-so-Metro Jam. So what would evolve into the BMX Jam, into X Jam, uh... That was my first official, like, I would say, big contest. I had done a few smaller stuff here and there, like local stuff uh, within my Durham region area. Uh, out in Ottawa, I did something. Uh, but that was the one that really, I think, kind of pushed for me to know that, like, BMX could be a thing in a way. And, like, I, I could progress further because I had known that I was, like, maybe a little bit higher up in level than some of my friends or some of the people I was riding with. But obviously until you, you get there with everybody and you see what's all working in the, like the Southern Ontario region, you really don't know. Right. So after winning that one, uh, that's when it kind of solidified, like, Hey, you should start bumping up and you need to kind of like try harder for yourself. Right. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, something that's so interesting too, is just the fact that it is like Toronto BMX jam, right? It's got such a legacy yeah. behind it, whether Miron and all these guys are doing it or yeah. not, it has such a big impact on our community. And to see yeah. that you went in and like, that's kind of where you got your start is really inspiring, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I will never ever forget that moment or those moments in my BMX career, because like you say, it really is the thing that pushed me to start branching out and to kind of be more well known outside of our area as well. Because like you say, it was the thing we had and people were coming from farther than just our small part of Southern Ontario to come ride that contest. Right. Like it was, it was a big deal to us. It's a bummer that it's not going to exist anymore at this point. Right. I really hope we can change that eventually, but yeah, man, that, Without that contest, I probably wouldn't have kept riding the way I, I did or even progressed to where I got to. Wild, dude. That's a, that's pretty crazy to think about, right? Just that one contest. Like, there's so many kids out there, especially nowadays, that are like, no, I don't want to enter. I'm going to, like, place last or anything like that. Yeah. And I had entered a joyride contest years ago, and I think I did place dead last. But what was funny <laughs> is that my dad, like, he was basically just saying, you know, you still did better than all the people who didn't compete, you know? You exactly. still went in and exactly. you still tried. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, I was also going to mention, you know, with Toronto BMX Jam, it's obviously placed just such a big thing for you. You know, over the years, you've pulled off some of the most insane combos and just tricks in general, some huge moves all done at the BMX Jam, right? Like, I feel like you're kind of the MVP of uh, BMX Jam. <laughs> and it's crazy to think that it all started basically just by going in 2007. But Obviously, you had said that 2005, you went and watched uh, the contest there. How many years did yeah. you watch before you actually competed? The I've watched two full years. I, I had wanted to compete, but it was also at a time where things were a lot harder to get into. Like the amateur contest would fill up instantaneous, right? Mm -hmm. And I also didn't believe I was quite on that level yet, even at that amateur level. I knew I had some tricks and whatnot, but the fact that it was in, at that time, the Rico Coliseum still, so it was this big open metro jam size course and it was like that scared the living bejeebas out of me uh so it took me 2005 is my first time ever going down seen it all was blown away uh we went again back in 2006 saw it and was just like dave mira showed up to that one chris doyle was 180 over the biggest box jump i ever seen at that time it was an absolute wild time and i knew that the next year no matter what i was entering it didn't matter what it was going to be. I didn't know that Metro Jam was going to go away, but I knew I was 100% entering amateur because I knew that with, uh, within that year, I was going to also progress, and I just wanted to be involved in it. Definitely. So, you know, the day finally comes around, and you're uh, entering in to compete. Obviously, you know, for people who have never been to Metro Jam, it's a weekend thing. You go in on a Friday to basically just do your practice laps and then – Saturday, you would compete. Sunday, you would be in the finals, right? Was yeah, it still yeah. like that at this time? It was a little different, if I remember correctly, because I think amateurs... No, I think you were still... It was amateurs did their thing first. Obviously, on the Saturday was when you uh, qualified, and then Sunday, you did still do your finals runs, but it was just in the morning versus later on for the pros. It's mm -hmm. been so long. The only thing I remember from that vividly, other than like obviously taking the win that year, was one of the head judges for the pros. He got detained at the border, so they wouldn't let him in. And because I was the guy who won, they just came over and were like, hey, do you want to do the judging of the contest? <laughs> and I was like, I never, <laughs> I never judged anything before, like at all. But I mean, obviously, I'm a bike rider. I, I know about bike riding. I know about people's skill levels, what's happening. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> dude that's wild although i really like that because uh when we talked to rooftop forever ago he had said yeah. you know we don't want judges in bmx that can't ride the course you need someone who knows how to ride the course knows the difficulty of the tricks and knows the transfers and whatnot that people are doing and just how difficult absolutely. it is absolutely it really takes a person that can physically do it right because anybody can sit there and critique another person it's it's not a, a challenging thing to do right we're we're human we're going to look at something and have a judgment towards it but if you can't actually drop in and do it you can't get in that eight foot quarter pipe you can't tell me that hop three whip into it wasn't crazy yeah like, it absolutely. absolutely was nuts you know yeah, definitely, dude. I'm a little worried about the Olympics and trying to see how that's going to work, right? Because things Absolutely. are obviously going to be a little different, right? Like, unless they Absolutely. just, yeah, maybe they will get the top dudes in BMX and just say, hey, you're the judges, you pick, you know? Yeah, it, I, I think that's the thing that it's going to come down to. I mean, the one challenge will always be with that is rider bias, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, me as a person who likes, say, more technical tricks, I'm going to see two tricks and I'm obviously going to have a comparison that says this one's a little bit better, but that's just, that's how I'm hardwired. Right. So it's hard to really find it a balance, but I think you still, like you say, you need somebody who can physically get in there and do it because if you can't, you're always going to just judge it based on what your brain thinks, but you don't know the feeling. So yeah, it's, it's going to be a quite a challenging thing for them to come up with, but I mean, that's why it's a giant UCI run thing and hopefully fingers crossed it goes as good as it possibly can right definitely yeah i'm really excited to see kind of where things go with it you know yeah um you know while we're on the topic of contest let's continue on with uh x jam here so can you remember any of the tricks from your run that you did in 2007 oh uh the one that i know for sure that i remember i mean i used to love doing tap to whip in stuff yeah and i also learned foof to whips because i saw drew b do them 
in a video and I was like, man, I got to be able to figure that out. Like that looks amazing. So I know for sure some of the stuff I did was like foof ice over pedal up to foof on a spine, like kind of do that 360 tap over. Yeah, I definitely did a foof to whip in my run. And then to finish my run off, I did a 540 tap whip in. And at the nice. time, I didn't really do much on quarter pipes. I did a lot on flat banks and stuff because I'd never been scared to just chuck a whip on a flat bank. If it doesn't work, throw your bike away, run down. Yeah. But a quarter was always that little bit, I don't know if it doesn't work, ugh, it's going to get hurt. But because you're in that contest mode, your brain just kind of clicks in a different way, right? And you just, you're, you're okay with it. You're like, I'm going to land this. There's no thought of like not landing when you're in that mindset, right? So those are the ones I can remember vividly. Dude, that uh, that already sounds like a great run, just with that three piece combo right there. You know, those three tricks all in a like all in the same run, dude. That's uh, that's a recipe right there. Anyways, continuing on. Um, you know, while we're on the topic of Metro Jam, let's continue here. So, how many years did you ride Metro Jam after two thousand seven? It seems like it was probably most of them. You know. Until uh, until I ended up going away and having to, I, I started my job with Cirque du Soleil. Uh, I rode every single one. I made sure to get there no matter what. That was like the one thing I wanted to do every year. Any other contest didn't matter. If I didn't even ride my bike that year, it didn't matter. I just wanted to make sure I was at Toronto BMX Jam. There was, oh, sorry, there was another year. So I missed it two years since 2007 riding in it. One year I had a blown out knee. So I had just had surgery obviously can't ride after that. Uh, and then the year that I couldn't make it back because at work, I just couldn't find the ability to get out of it. Definitely. That's uh that's pretty rad though. It seems like you literally went to every single one that you could, you know, <laughs> I absolutely did. Everyone I could, I would make sure I'd be there, especially as it got to the end too. It became even more of something towards my heart because the, the people who put it on Zeb Dennis, uh, Kevin Seabrook, Greg Stevens, they all, they were such good friends in the riding community that I was just like, I wanted to be there to help even. It didn't even matter if it was like, I could not ride that weekend. I just, I'll give me the hammer. I'm going to slam in, you know, a nail here and there just to, to be around it. it. It really was an energy of, of BMX, right? Definitely, man. And I really want to say, you know, I think Zeb and all those guys did a great job on the last couple of years that they were in charge. Yeah. And uh, just the fact that they even went ahead and you know tried to do it is incredible mm -hmm. right they did an amazing yeah, job absolutely. like having that much responsibility on something that a community loves so much right like it's got to be nerve-wracking yeah. oh yeah oh yeah and i mean obviously everybody has their own opinion on what what to do and what this and that but the fact that they just they took it and we're like look we're gonna we're gonna make this happen that is you can't do nothing but give them respect for that definitely man definitely i fully agree with you there um, anyways, 2014 comes around and Metro Jam, of course, and, uh, we see you do a whip to ice to whip. And what's funny is there's a calling the shots video on YouTube of you and Drew at Joyride. Yeah. And, uh, this must have either been filmed before or after, but, uh, he had asked you to do, um, the same combo. And then instantly he was like, you know, just think of it as Toronto BMX Jam. <laughs> so that calling the shots was filmed after. But that that move itself, I remember that weekend coming into it, seeing that sub box and being there a five foot quarter with I think the sub, I can't even remember. It's like a four foot sub. Like it is the perfect combination of uh, just enough height with the fact that you have just enough space. Like it really is the perfect spot to try this trick. Um, so what I did is I knew that the best trick was coming. So I think in my runs that year, I didn't really try too much. I was just like, I got through my runs, did whatever I needed to do. And I, everything was planned to do the whip ice whip because I had, I had thought about it for so long. I learned ice whips thanks to a uh, shout out to somebody out here in Quebec, Max Vincent, for doing like the first ice whips on quarters and just bringing it to the world, basically. Uh, so I learned that trick and I never actually had done a whip ice ever. That's my first ever whip ice right there. Wow. But I knew that... That in that moment, if I could get a whip lock into an ice pick, I knew how good I was at ice whips that I could just I could make it happen. There was there was no denying that. And it crazy enough, in that entire best trick, we had 20 minutes. That is the last trick that got done because we were at 19 minutes 
40 seconds, whatever, and Catfish is going, hey, one last try, Mox. And I'm like, it's got to happen now. So I'm like, I'm still unpumped that my foot slipped that little bit, but I knew that, you know, this is it. It's now or never. Because at this moment, like, there was no, no other ramps that I could go try this on. It would be have to bring a sub box somewhere. So it was like, let's get this done. And I just, as soon as I stomped into the ice, it was like, there's tail whips coming back around right now. <laughs> Dude, that is so rad. Honestly, just to hear the kind of backstory on that is really sick. And it's such a wild combo that I don't think I've seen many people do, you know? It's from as far as I know. And I mean, it's hard because now with the way the internet is, there's so many people, there's so many good riders. I don't know that anybody's done another whip ice whip. There's somebody I can think of instantly who I know could get it done, but he always does whip ice bar. And that's Mike Varga. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, dude. If there's anybody who could do a whip ice whip right now, I guarantee that kid could figure it out. Well, there you hear it, Varga. Get on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, he seems like the man for the job, you know, to bring it mm -hmm, into mm -hmm. the 2020s. Definitely Varga's yeah. got to get it done. I still want to be one to do another super clean one. And I was hoping to to get something and find something while we were on tour during last year and stuff. But as things go, the world changed and uh, I haven't ridden my BMX as much as I would like to. Yeah, man, the last year has been really rough, especially for someone like yourself who, uh, you know, your profession is basically riding your bike. Like, yes, that's sir. a lot of what you do, obviously. <laughs> um anyways before we get to that let's uh talk a little bit more about metro jam so 2017 you did the uh whip to foof on the back rail Ooh. and dude i was there in the crowd and i gotta say man i was fucking screaming the loudest that was the <laughs> coolest shit ever man dude it's funny you say that dude because honestly i don't really know where we came up with the idea I think it was like a joke between Zeb, the boys and me and kind of being like, cause I'm known for like, obviously I've had breaks pretty much my entire career, my actual professional career. I've always had breaks. I will always have a back break. It's just, it's who I am. It's a, the rider I am. Right. Uh, and I love to do a foo So something about that day, I think Drew was there too. And we were just talking about the back rail and it was like, Hey, foo fit foof bar bar foof what do you think and i think it's because the year prior yeah now if i remember correctly it's true uh we had dave mirrors passing yep uh for that that metro jam and i remember that night uh before finals i had told myself i'm gonna do a bar to back rail foof because back in the day mira was well known for doing crazy big bar to back rail foof and i remember doing it and then after that year, I said, next year, if there's another big one, I have to do a whip to foof. It was like, it was homage to not only Dave Osato for doing whip to foofs back in the day, but the fact that I, uh, I love that trick. Not many people were doing whip to foof anymore ish, you know, I still love the trick. It's one of my favorite things to just do. Cause once you lock in, whether it's on a quarter pipe, whether it's got coping, no coping, whether it's on a sub box, something about once you do a tail whip and you lock into that foof, it is just the best feeling ever. Yeah, dude. It was uh, seriously the craziest fucking thing I've ever witnessed. <laughs> like, dude, <laughs> so wild. And what I love, too, is uh, I had just started dating my girlfriend at the time. And, yeah. like, we had went to, uh, you know, we went to Toronto BMX Jam. I was really excited about it because this is kind of her first experience seeing, like, BMX and why I love it so much, you know? Yeah. And, uh I can only imagine for her not really knowing much just to like witness me sitting there getting so pumped to see you pull this <laughs> and then like freak out and go nuts about it. Dude, I remember being in the car on the way home being like, I can't believe Moxley did whip to foof. And she's like, yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> like, it's, it's wild how many people got so much feeling out of that trick. And I mean, I obviously got a pretty wild feeling too out of it. It, it took, you know, how many tries to actually end up getting it. And you can, it's so wild to watch the clip in the slow-mo where my back wheel gets on the actual rail before my feet get on, because it was just like, it's not the ramp that, and like the setup that you're supposed to do a whip foof on because I'm already jumping over the original sub to get past it. Right. And like that, that momentum it took and like that smack in there. Oh, it was, 
it was mind blowing that I like, as I got my feet fully on, I went, Oh, I did it. And I, I, I still can't like, I'll never have that exact feeling again, you know, but it's, it's so weird how my brain and how sometimes our brains can just kind of almost go into slow-mo ourselves. I just, that was that one, a hundred percent, a whole year. Now that I remember correctly about the bar foof the year prior, I thought about that for one year long. <laughs> wild dude. <laughs> yeah, man. It's such a wild clip. Seriously. It's hard to even like, <laughs> For people who weren't there, it's not really going to make much sense. But if you know BMX, you know how difficult it is to do a whip foof. And like, obviously, you know, that's one of my dream tricks. And I suck <laughs> at tail whips and it'll probably <laughs> never happen. But, you know, I'd love to imagine that I could do it even just on a uh, on like a five foot mini ramp. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's a, a magical feeling feeling trick I, after i learned the whip to foof man i want i've been wanting to do it on anything and everything that i could anything that seemed reasonable and i felt like i could make it happen yeah man we gotta see it again that was uh such a rad <laughs> like you know you gotta find the even bigger back rail go to uh yeah dude go to like the source park you know battle I, of the hastings it's, it's crazy that you say that <laughs> that tom that tom justice one man yeah. i watched it and i was like for sure that i it was a crazy foof in and in itself. There's nobody's taking anything away from that foof. It was gnarly as fuck. But I looked at how much time he had going up. And I know Tom and I know him and his tail whips. He's good at them. He's not like the best at spinning the whip the fastest. That's just not how he does his stuff, you know. But I watched it and I instantly went, man, a, a whip to foof on that would be fucking amazing dude greatest clip ever right there literally the best yeah. trick that you could ever do like that would be insane uh, oh I'd, man i'd stop riding <laughs> <laughs> now here's a question for you and yeah. uh i only asked this because a moment ago you told us that you were doing foof to whip how come you didn't yeah. do uh you know whip foof whip <laughs> <laughs> Well, first of all, that springboard of a railing, which is not really a railing, it's just put there for safety. Uh, and secondly, foof the whips, as I've gotten older too, uh, they've gotten a hell of a lot harder. Just the way uh, at which your body weight has to be for a foof whip. I haven't done one in a few years now because of it, but it's it really is like you can't use that that kick of your like your kind of your pedal pressure. I would say for like a tap whip, I can just kind of give it a heavy kick. And then do a tail whip foof is just it's pure muscle it's literally get in the right spot and muscle that son of a bitch around yeah but damn that would have been sick <laughs> dude insane right um but yeah. I, I was gonna mention you know i can do whips and i can do foof and news i would not be able to do the two of them combined <laughs> like i've thought about it and i've tried it on banks before but it's yeah. just so like it's exactly what you're saying right where normally you can use a little bit of pedal pressure, but if you're on your brakes, yeah. you can't really use any pedal pressure. And then with a Fufanu, you know, if you don't already start to try and muscle it around, it's yeah. like, I don't know, man. I feel like the comparison to try and do a whip into it is almost like you need to do like a Fufanu to 360 out because of mm -hmm. just how mm -hmm. much strength you need to pull the bike yeah. around to do a whip into it. Yeah, it really takes a, a different kind of, foof in itself it's a it's for sure a different trick you do a standard foof you just do it and you back in but you do it like foof to whip you're really like it's a whole new process the foof is almost nothing it's yeah. how do i make sure that i'm gonna pop up in the air while turning while whipping while trying to get back like there's a lot of it lots going on when you're trying that one yeah dude absolutely um you know, now that we're done talking a little bit about uh, Metro Jam and whatnot, let's talk sponsors because you had actually had quite a few like really cool sponsors over the years. Obviously, Sour Fever, um, Chris yeah. Silva's clothing company, and then you know also Stolen Bikes, which is really cool, right? Like they're a they're a great company, kind of based out of the UK, if I'm correct. Yeah, they they have two locations. The UK is where it all started, but then California is where that other base location was. Uh, before that, actually, even I was sponsored by Colony. That was one of the sponsorships that I still regret to this day from moving on uh, just because of that was kind of like the time where I was like, oh, man, this is a sponsor I want to be on. Like all the team was kind of in my head, generally what I wanted to be at. I wanted to, you know, possibly go on team trips and whatnot with them. Um, but what ended up happening there is 
the whole stolen thing came about. And the reason that the stolen thing came about is I was writing for a distribution company at the time. And so I don't know if you know much about distribution companies and the way that the sponsorships work sometimes, but it's like, if that distro doesn't then distro the other product anymore, they're going to want to obviously move you on to another team and you want to be a part of something that's within that distribution. Cause obviously it's a give and take for both companies. It's not only just the company you're writing for, but it's that distribution company as well. So that's where my initial getting on stolen came from is the company I had rode for, which was Jagger Co in Quebec at the time, they they had distributed Colony, so I got put on Colony. I, I kind of was a good fit for that, right? I get to, I got to text, uh, sorry, email Clint Miller and kind of be like, boom, I'm on this super awesome team. Like, like the bikes, the team was doing something cool. They were talking about stuff that we could do in the future, and I was real pumped. But they didn't enjoy the distribution side of things, so they ended up jumping ship to distribution. It was uh, kill them all at the time. Um, and so what happened to me is the company I had rode for, the, the Canadian company, they looked at it and were like, look, you can stay on that other team, but then we're going to have to drop you from our other stuff. And at that moment, you know, especially at your younger age, it's BMX is your income. For me at the time, I had to kind of see one paid, one didn't pay. Even if I liked one over the other one, it was like paycheck is always going to have to come first in that moment, right? Uh, so we went through that and then I got on stolen. Don't get me wrong. I enjoyed my years on stolen. It was awesome. Once I actually started talking to the team manager at the time and, and speaking to the brand themselves, that was really awesome. Uh, and that kind of helped me to further my relationship with them. And so the distribution kind of fell off and I, I moved on from that, but I stayed friends with the stolen team. And so then I started working direct. It wasn't the longest relationship. It kind of just, in a way, fizzled out. I feel like their international program wasn't as strong. And so that's what kind of like between 2013 and 2016, those were my years on Stolen. And a lot of the stuff I ended up doing, a lot of the, the bigger tricks and whatnot, it was all done on Stolen stuff. Because that's when I was in that, like, that hammer time of my life in BMX. Yeah, definitely. And I was going to say, I really do remember you riding for them and... uh you know, throughout there, you had quite a few really nice bikes through them. Um, mm -hmm. I think the one that you had last was probably the one that you did the whip foof on, or maybe you had built up yep. a different bike for that. But, uh, yeah, dude, those, like, I just remember kind of meeting you around then for the first time. It wouldn't have been yep. when I was at all in, it was probably before that, just seeing you at joyride or something. But, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, dude, I definitely remember you riding those bikes and whatnot. And, yeah, I rode the, the piss out of those bikes. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't really remember if they gave you too many different bikes or if maybe if you were just riding one. It was at that time, I was like I said, when I was younger, I was enthralled with BMX. I had to watch every BMX edit. I had to know what new parts were coming out. I wanted to pull my bike apart and change the colors of it. So they did give me a fair few amount of bikes. Nothing out of the ordinary, obviously, like every six months you're bashing your shit, you want to get some new parts or whatever. Um, and so I would end up pulling stuff apart three months in and I'd be painting it and just like making it feel fresh, you know, because that's that's how my BMX was when I was younger. I just I always wanted like a new thing. It always felt like if you did some sort of thing, like paint your bike, switch your sprocket, change your seat, you had a new bike almost. Everything was damn same, but you put a new set of pedals on. It's, oh, my God, it's a new bike. Absolutely, man. I'm going through the... Uh... <laughs> kind of the phase of where i've been riding this cult hawk frame for quite a few years and i've been able to score a pretty good deal on a new frame i'm just kind yeah. of waiting for it to be shipped at this point and uh i'm really excited because i think now getting a new frame is just gonna like set me off for riding again where last year i kind of just took it easy i had an ankle injury yeah. and then just kind of you know hung out and really only kept up with riding a little bit rather than yeah. years before i'd be doing video parts and whatnot so you know, hopefully a new bike will get me real stoked on riding. I kind of feel the same way, though. If I just painted it, I guarantee I would have been like, oh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's crazy. It's just a small thing, but it's that aesthetic thing that really, like, it tricks the brain and be like, oh, this is something new again. It's that newness because that's that's what it was. That's what BMX has always had for what I would say me especially, but most people is like, it's why we keep learning tricks. It's it's new. It's exciting. It's that that pure excitement. 
Definitely, dude. Yeah, fully agree with you there. It's a whenever you learn a new trick, it's obviously going to be like one of the better days you have in BMX, right? And I feel Absolutely. so weird because. For the last like little while, I really haven't learned too much stuff. I've just been keeping up and like trying new <laughs> gaps and transfers and stuff. But uh, this year is the year that I'm going to learn a bunch of tricks that I've been trying to learn for years. So boom, there you go. It's I, I feel you on that kind of like, you know, I stay at my level. I do the tricks I like doing, but you're not you're not changing too much. It's not like when you were, you know, your first five years of riding where it was like there was new tricks almost every other session. Yeah. It's a whole new trick, right? It wasn't just like a, a, a different variation of something. It was a literal new trick. Absolutely, man. I'm learning a whole bunch of uh, front brake moves this year. That's a must. That's I sick. Want them. That's sick. Hell yeah. Um, anyways, you know, we talked a little bit about riding for Stolen. You were with them for about three, four years. And then, yeah. you know, was there any really good moments for them? Because I don't really remember if they were doing like tours and whatnot, you know, big uh, like... I don't know, just big tours there, around. There wasn't a lot. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot involving me. Uh, at the time, I was like, I do ride everything. I've never been a BMX rider that's like, I ride this, I ride, I don't ride that. Like, I've always just been a bike rider. And that's because I grew up at a different time where we just, we went out and rode bikes. It didn't matter what we rode on. We just rode our BMXs. Um, but at the time, like I say, still, their international team was like, it was a weird thing because a lot of it came through distros. So you didn't talk as much to the company. And so when they put on team trips, it was usually just like the, the U S pro dudes. Um, so I didn't get a lot of opportunity that way through them. Um, but they did come to through Toronto one time for like a street, uh, a street tour. And so I got to meet up with a, quite a few of them and that was really cool. But again, at that time for me, I was very much a show rider. Uh, you know, like I, I've never not ridden bikes, but I also had to make a living riding bikes. And my way of making a living was to go do stunt shows. And so me doing stunt shows meant I wasn't always around. So even that, that two, no, it was a week and a half. I think they came. I only got to see them twice because I was like, I was in town for a second. Then I was gone. Then I was back in town. Then I was gone again, you know? Yeah, I was going to mention, for uh, people who don't know, you actually have done a lot of different stunt shows through the Crazy Crew and a couple other uh, companies like that. And it's such an interesting part of BMX that, uh, dude, I really wish that when I was younger that the school would have, like, had, you know, a stunt crew in just for a day or something. Like, it blows my yeah. mind that schools even do that, mainly just because, like, there's really nothing about, like, you know, obviously learning or curriculum about it. Like <laughs> it's a, uh, I don't know. It's really cool though. It's always something that blows my mind that there's like a market for, you know? Yeah. School shows, the market for school shows is a lot bigger, obviously in the U S yeah. first of all, their population just in general compared to us. And secondly, the, the thing that kind of drives them and, and they're able to do so many shows in schools is based off of the same thing, like uh, mothers against drunk driving it's it's stuff like that you know it's it's to get right. kids off the street get kids to not be joining gangs look at this stuff we do it, you know you feel good it's cool to do like everything about it is awesome so like they have a much simpler way to sell the idea of a show versus us up here it's not so easy to just do a school show but we do a lot of obviously more fairs and things like that because who doesn't like going to something you know you get to ride the at the carnival you go on the ride and stuff and then you go hey look at this guy doing a backflip like this is cool to see so yeah it's it's definitely something that i would love to know what my life would have been like without it but at the same time i don't ever think i would ever want to know a life without it because it was so much fun just traveling around just doing backflips and tail whips all the time and like just some little kid in the crowd is the most stoked ever because you you looked at him during a trick or whatever right yeah, absolutely. It's such an important moment for so many people, you know, just to kind of witness this. And I think that it does a lot for our community and getting it out there for people, because if people who don't really know much about BMX, you know, in their everyday life, where are they going to see most BMX riders? They don't go to the skate yeah. park, so they're not going to see kids no. there. They're going to see kids out in the street doing street riding. And, you know, it's definitely one of those things that sometimes people aren't really into that. They don't understand it. They no. don't get it. They think you're damaging property. So to see a different side of it where there's people that are park riding and doing these tricks yeah. on ramps and they're, oh, look yeah. at these, look at these guys. They're successful. They're at this fair getting yeah. paid to do tricks, right? It's a little exactly. bit of a different 
lifestyle within BMX. However, it's so needed and so important to really level things out with us, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like you said, seeing that structured organization sometimes can really help a parent go like, oh yeah, I wouldn't mind if my kid went to the skate park to ride. You know, like yeah. you say, street, street riding is awesome. I love street I've The one thing I've missed about being on tour a little bit is that that camaraderie of just like going outside and street riding, hanging around with your friends. Because like you don't have to do anything crazy that day. You're just rolling around, right? Yeah. But for a parent to see that, they're like, oh, you're not doing anything worthwhile. But to see that show kind of environment, it's like, oh, I see there's progression. You're getting better. All your friends, like it makes sense, right? It's, it's, it's sellable essentially. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's important to certain parents out there, right? Not, not mm -hmm. everybody has parents like my dad who is just like, yeah, dude, I'll buy you a bike. Like I'm a skater, you know, <laughs> I'm into this. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I definitely think, uh, it's interesting to kind of talk to some people who I think Crumlish was talking with me a couple weeks ago, just about, you know, his dad, when he got into BMX was like, well, why are you wrecking these ledges? Like what's going on here? You know? He didn't really understand <laughs> it because he came from like a mountain biking background. Yeah. 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 Yeah, of course. Yeah. Anyways, uh, you know, doing shows, how long were you doing shows for? And obviously with everything going on with COVID-19 right now, you obviously can't really do them. So how much have you missed it the last uh, year or so? Oh, so doing shows, man, I can't actually remember the first shows I did. It was 100% it was for that company I rode for like through Stolen and Colony would be Jagger. If I remember correctly, they're the first company I ever did shows for. I would say it, it'd have to be, if I rode for Stolen 2013, 20, it's probably 2011, 2011, 2012. And like I, I got involved with the other show coming because there was only two kind of in the local area. It was Jagger Co. Uh, and then Crazy Crew. Mm -hmm. And so I got involved. I got involved with both. I ended up kind of like jagger pushing them away and i did all of my shows to crazy crew um and i did them all the way up until essentially uh i'd say until i got the job with cirque still till that kind of hit so that was that's been going on three years now three four years man it's time flies sometimes mm. uh but but to answer about how it's felt initially is awesome as a, as a show writer, not like the show writer that I am now being that I'm part of the circus, we do a lot of shows. We do six days a week type of shows. Um, so that's like over and over and over. So don't get me wrong. I love doing it. But having that break, that first initial, especially even the first three months was magical. I was just like, man, I don't care about my BMX right now. Like, it's cool. It's there. I can go ride if I want. But this is feeling awesome to just chill. But now we're sitting at that point where we've passed the full year mark of me getting back home and I'm itching like crazy, not just to, to get out and ride BMX, but to get out and perform again, because it had been last a couple of days ago, probably last week, where a couple of friends from the show had posted that it's been literally one year since our last performance on stage. Wild. And it's just like, it's, it's crazy because it really was like, you know, everybody got told the same thing. Ah, oh, two weeks, go home, and then we'll all be back to it. And now yeah. we're looking at a year, a year later, and I'm like, so is there a back to it? Like, when do we get to type of thing, you know? So, yeah, the itch is there a lot. So I want to just also get out and ride BMX as a general thing as well. But obviously living not in Ontario, first of all. We live in Quebec, so things are still closed up here. In comparison to, say, All In, Joyride just now got opened up to a little bit. There is a local park not too far away uh, with the one in Ottawa called The Yard. So mm -hmm. I'm looking to try and get over there. But I'm also one of those people that's kind of like, man, every bit of information we hear about the, the COVID stuff, it's like, I don't know what to go on. So I don't want to be the jackass that does whatever the hell he wants to do. But I also don't want to be the jackass that is sitting inside when he could go out and do something. So I'm really stuck in those middles, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's something that a lot of people have difficulty with, right? And I know yeah. my fair share of people who think the whole thing is bullshit. And you know what, mm -hmm. that's okay. Like, if that's what yeah. you think, then, you know, don't feel, I don't know, don't feel like uh, you have to feel a certain way about it, I guess. Yeah. Like, it's hard to understand. And I think everybody, even the people who are in charge, you know, don't know yeah. what we're doing at this point. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there's so much that, uh, 
is happening right now and it's really weird to just try and put it all on a couple people and say hey you know you are in charge of 30 million people you got to figure it out but yeah it's it's truly a wild time and then you also have to think about like say for me in my instance is i have my girlfriend and then we are near her immediate family her her mother and dad at all time Mm -hmm. and so and her her mother is also like much more compromised being a small 60 something year old woman. It's just like, I also don't want to be the jackass that goes and does something. And I'm like, I'll be fine. But then I bring in it, you know? So it's like, I've really had to battle all those sides about being like, Hey, I'm just going to go ride. Cause I don't care. And I'll, I'll be fine. And whatever. I know there's a thing, but I should be okay. And then there's that other side of like, yeah, but I'm going to then be around somebody who's really worried about it. And then I'm going to have to deal with that situation. So yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a hard one. Like you said, there's like a handful of people that everybody's looking towards to get the answers and they don't have the goddamn answers. Yeah, exactly. Right. And uh, I think the hardest part about all of this is exactly what you said there about, you know, you would be fine because you're 33 years old, yeah. you know. However, it doesn't work that way because if you go out and do something, you'll be fine. But if you talk Mm -hmm. to somebody who's in their 60s, they could get really sick. Like it's a it's kind of a weird thing. It sucks that it works the way it does, because if it was just that, you know, oh, you know, it's direct, right? Like you're the only one that can get it and you can't pass it on. Then this wouldn't be an issue. It wouldn't even be a thing. Right. Yeah, exactly. That that's you said it so perfectly there. It's like if it was just based on me, fine, I I'll deal with it. I mean, funny enough that we're talking about this situation a little bit. While we were on tour, we were in Atlanta at the end of 2018 going in or 2018. What year is it now? Geez, 2019. Um, And we believe because a lot of people got sick in our show and they got sick hard. Yeah. And so we believe a lot of us actually went through it at that moment because that's when it was kind of just starting to build up as a thing mm. and obviously we do we do performances anywhere between you know 2500 5000 people in our audience a day a yeah. single night right so like there's a lot of movement in there and my girlfriend as well she got hit with what we didn't know we never got it checked out or anything but while we were on what's our our week off basically when our tour actually moves along uh she got hit with something and like to the point where she almost couldn't physically do anything. And it now that we've kind of seen it all and we hear all of what could happen, we literally look at each other and go, you you had COVID 100%. There's, there's nobody going to tell me anything else. So like, we know that we might have even been through it. Right. But again, like you say, it's like, what if I go out now and then I, I, I'm passing things along? It's, it's just, it's such a, a weird time for it, man. It's, it's really annoying. Another hard thing is being Canadians in the area that we live we also now had to deal with winter. Yeah. So for me, that that's been another hard one because I wasn't BMXing all summer, but I was still riding bikes all summer. Mm-hmm. I picked up myself a road bike and a gravel bike, and I've been lost in the woods because I'm just alone, right? So I knew that I could still be safe, and I'm obsessed with two, two wheels. As you grow older, I guess you learn that you don't just love BMX, you love all wheels. And so, man, I've just been at least still had that, but the winter hit, and I was like, Oh, but now I don't have that. What am I going to do? <laughs> Definitely, man. It's uh, it's really difficult to deal with, you know, and I know yeah. that everybody's kind of dealing with it in their own way. Myself, personally, I'm so lucky that I have this show because doing the podcast means that I get that, you know, a little bit of social time each week where I basically just meet a new person, right? I don't get to see my friends as often and... Uh, yeah. I think that that's okay because I still have something I can rely on. Right. And yeah, I guess it all depends on the way you look at it, but same thing, dude, I rarely see my parents now, like haven't seen my grandparents in over a year. That's for sure. And, uh, yeah, like anybody that I think is, you know, just passing that range, I try to stay away from just because I don't want to be the person that's, you know, solely responsible for that. Exactly. Exactly. And that, that's what it comes down. It's responsibility. And that's where, like you said, you can have your opinion. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Whatever. I'm fine with all everybody's opinion on anything. I'm just looking to not be responsible. That's mm-hmm. it. I just don't want responsibility. Definitely. 
Anyways, you know, let's talk a little bit about uh, your part in the six tape two video with BMX Fu, and then we're gonna jump into some of the Cirque du Soleil stuff, which I'm very cool. excited to talk about. So cool, cool. Yeah, while we talk about this, I'm gonna put the uh, video on in the background. Anyways, you had a video part in BMX Fu's six tape two. I really enjoyed seeing a more street side of you. Your tech combos in the streets are hard to replicate, and it's refreshing to see a gyro and a cassette. You know, <laughs> out in the wild, essentially. <laughs> how long were you working on this project for? I wasn't really sure how long the six tape kind of uh, took to film, or at least the second one. And I know that I it's feel... a little different for BMX Foo. Like, they, they're they not, I don't know, they're not very, uh, they're not going to tell you, like, hey, you have to come and film this part, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so that one, it's kind of funny. It's obviously, it's in collaboration with Foo, and that's because of uh, Trent Barker, who's the one who did all of the editing of it. Yeah. Um, so he's really good friends with Charlie, with Greg, everybody in NF. Uh, so it's kind of a collaboration with, but most of like the main parts, it was at the time it was people living in Toronto. That's why it was called six tape, obviously. Um, so me personally, I think I worked on my section for about a, I want to say about a year. It's really hard to like recall it all because I mean, you'll even notice that my bike changes within it because I'm always on the move. I'm always switching things up, obviously. Um, but I feel like it was a solid year of when I was around. That's when I would do I would do what I could, you know. So we always had at least one camera with somebody. Mostly Chijo had the camera with him, and we just like we get to a spot, everybody start cruising around doing our stuff, and then I'd be like, "Hey, I think I could do this," you know. And I would just try and like. That's always been one of my goals and one of my favorite things about um, riding and filming stuff because I've filmed for years and years. I've done a lot of filming. It was always like, what could I come up with on the spot instantly, you know, or what somebody would say. And I'd be like, oh, that makes sense. Like, I think I could do that, you know. So, yeah, probably roughly a year in my part. I try and like look at the bike, see which color I'm on and stuff. And that kind of gives me the idea of when. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Dude, some of the clips in here are incredible. There's a spot <laughs> that's right near the CN Tower. There used to be a curved wall ride across the street. And yeah. you do a uh, a Smith grind to 180 up onto the top of the manual pad and half cab whip off. And it's just yeah. such a great combo. And I love the use of cassette in that because obviously that plays a big role in it. Yeah, yeah, that was a that was a learn on the spot type of thing. Like I'd Wild. be doing a lot of, a, a lot of like Smith pull up you know, stuff at that time. And I was just like, I wonder if I could do a Smith up 180. And I was like, half cab whips has just been something that I've learned for so long. Uh, and I was like, if this works, well, I mean, I'll just half cab whip out of it. And turned out a couple tries later and we, we had a clip. <laughs> Hell yeah. And we just saw a mini flip a second ago. Oh. That is so gnarly. <laughs> that one was wild. That was a hard flip to get around. I've tried to flare it. It has not worked. Yeah. Um, but that one was like, I think the boys who were like rolling around one day, it was just like, yo, you think you can flip it? I'm like, I don't know. Like the, the only way I'm ever going to know is like if I try it. So I think that day we kind of just did a couple of those bunny hop feels. Didn't do it. It was like, okay, I'll come back. One of the days we were back around. I was just feeling good. It's like, all right, let's do it. I threw the music on. And like, as soon as the music goes on for me, that's it. It's, it's I got, ready. I, I put on some, some sort of heavy rap music and I am just, I'm in a zone. Definitely. Now, here's a good question for you. Do you listen to rap while you're riding park or do you listen to like more uh, techno -y stuff? And then when you're riding street, it's rap. So for me, it's always been rap music. Nice. hundred percent. It's, it's been hip hop no matter what. As I've grown older, I've grown more into liking more music in it, in and of itself. But as a young kid, before I rode BMX and stuff, I was a basketball player and a lot of my friends were black friends and so i obviously listened to a lot of hip-hop growing up as a kid because at that time it's like you know you have your dad's music and stuff like that like 12 years old whatever i'm listening to zeppelin acdc stuff like that but that that wasn't my choice you know like i heard that through my dad right and then my friends got me into lil wayne eminem back in the day and it was just like boom that it's been in my ears since then so since i was like 11 years old i just been listening to hip-hop <laughs> that's awesome dude are you a fan of uh mf doom i have listened to some mf doom i'm not as big of a fan of uh like jordan is 
<laughs> but uh, I'm more of like, because I was at the time, it was like Lil Wayne, Cash Money Millionaires. Like, it's kind of like that stereotypical rap at that time, you know? And it's just, it's been in, in me forever. And that's just what it is. I've tried to branch out. I've never really been like, the lyricistness has not hit me that way. It's always been a beat. So that's what I've, I've learned as I've gotten older is like now I'll listen to some crazy heavy dubstep stuff when I'm doing, you know, climbing a hill out here and whatnot, because it's just, I realize it's beat. It's, a, it's just a heavy, like kind of constant bang. And that just gets my whole, like my everything starts shaking. I'm just like excited for it. Yeah, definitely. I could totally see that. <laughs> Anyways, getting back on the six tape here, I wanted to talk about your second last clip in the video, which is this wild flare, you know, on this <laughs> tiny little brick bank. First of all, I love this spot. I would love to go and ride this. It looks incredible. I'm a huge Montreal. fan. Dude, really? Yeah. That's sick. Yeah, yeah it's actually... one of the few clips after we left, uh, after I kind of had left the city and I went to start working for Cirque du Soleil, that was... The boys came down, stayed with me to get some clips while I was living in Montreal and I had space for them. And so I'd known about this little spot and I was like, hey, I think I could flare it. Dude, this is going to blow your fucking mind. I was <laughs> actually riding this spot like two, three years ago. Now I'm just kind of picturing it because of the brick bank. And then with you saying it's in Montreal, I now know for sure that it is. I rode the spot before. It's incredible. <laughs> Yeah, it's like it's funny how if you film something in a certain way, sometimes you're just like, ah, I I don't know if I've been there or not. But yeah, it's it's because the bank just goes for so long, right? It gets a lot bigger. Oh it's my god, super yeah, fun. It's super fun to just roast it. But I knew that 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 bottom section had a little bit of a kick to it, and so at the time I was like, I was really good at small flares. Right now, not the best because I haven't been riding so much. But like, I love a tiny flare. It's like one of my favorite things to do. As long I've always said, if you can air it, you can flare it nice and so like and it's usually worked out <laughs> that's awesome dude i'm gonna need you to send me the pin for this spot because i've been here before Absolutely. i cannot remember for the life of me where it is i know it's near griffin town though i believe it's called it's uh i can't remember the name of the the area but it's downtown montreal right on the water it's like yeah. it's super easy to find it's literally part of like just at the behind that building is a bike path yeah, it literally like swings past the water and you come off the bike path and boom, there's that spot. Dude, I'm going to try and find it on Google Maps. And if I don't find <laughs> it, I'm going to send you a DM and you got to send me this because I'm coming back. Absolutely. I'm coming back this summer for a, a trip for like a week and yeah. we're going to be riding a lot of different Montreal stuff. I was looking for yeah. the wall ride school and I fucking found it on Google Maps. And I was so <laughs> Amazing. excited and uh, Amazing. Dude, I've rode it before. It's a great spot. There's so many spots that I've rode before, and I've been trying to just kind of figure out where they were again. And uh, I yeah. found quite a few on Google Maps. There's still a few that I'm kind of looking for, and we'll see if I can find them all. But we'll, uh, it's going to be a good trip. I'm really excited for it. Crazy how that works out when you just like you're in the zone of riding sometimes, and you just the spot is awesome. So you just ride, and then you, you totally forget everything about where the spot is. It's just like you remember the spot. But then when you want to go ride it again, you're like, where, where was that again? I, Damn it. Why didn't I pay attention just a little bit more? Definitely, dude. I've uh, I've been taking a lot of notes recently. I'm like, anytime that I get to a spot, I typically take a photo of it. And then I've got like yeah. the geolocation in my phone <laughs> or I'll write down where it is or pin it on my maps. When I open I Google Maps. like that. Yeah. Dude, when I open Google Maps nowadays, it's like 800 different things, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, when I first uh, first like, kind of moved to Toronto and I was just take my single speed out, I'd just be rolling around and go, oh, this looks like a spot. Photo, name it, like, boom, okay, that's logged forever, you know? Yeah. Plan routes out based on just like, okay, we can hit this spot and then this spot is just over here and then this spot and perfect, we'll do a, a circle and we're back towards like the starting spot dude anyways you know you had talked a little bit about this clip i'm gonna show it now on stream but uh how many tries did it take to pull it off oh that one uh i want to say it was like five ish tries i ended up blowing out my wheel bad because that that bike that i got there was my first like official cirque bike right. so everything about that bike is there's titanium everything all the spokes are titanium and at the time it was like i didn't quite understand how brittle Thai was in that way you know i i initially only ever rode you know chromali everything so i could beat it up a whole lot more 
Uh, and so, yeah, the first, first time I, if I remember correctly, trying to get around the bike, didn't quite come around. I went to feet and was like, Oh, okay, cool. Went a couple more times, like fourth time or whatever, pulling as hard as I could just half like sideways landed and went and was like, Oh no. And Chijo was there and just like grabs out the spoke key, tries to start like just getting it to roll basically, you know, yeah. so the clip that I even landed it in my wheel for sure looks like this. Oh like my it, God. It's, it's for sure. I think it even touched at a point, but I just like kept that push <laughs> through it, you know, because sometimes what ends up happening is I just get it in my head. is like, dude, you just gotta, you gotta yank just a little harder. And so like, I don't want to give up on it. I'm like, I'm going to get this to work unless my bike snaps in half. <laughs> So what are your uh, Stephen Moxley tips on how to do a small flare? You know, for the people out there uh, that can flare, what's your advice? The the hardest thing with the small flare is realizing that you really like it's a weight. It's not like when you go on a like a six foot quarter, even like, that's not even big now by any means. You can like you got that kind of a uh, you go up the ramp and you really kind of like pop off ish, but you pop up. With the small flare, there's no pop up, right? Because, I mean, you're not going to get fully a pop. So it's more like it's that as you take off, you really got to let that back wheel kind of like hit whatever it is, whether it's coping, whether it's just like the, the edge of the, the tip of whatever. And it really is that that last and boom. And like something about it, if you've, if you've done it right, that like that, that pull in, you're, you're coming around. You're 100% coming around. Obviously, you're going to stay as tucked as possible until you're around and you can open up again. Dude, that's so wild. I remember trying to film this clip of my buddy Jesse doing a flare on a bank, and uh, yeah. it did not go very well. He got like <laughs> upside down and ditched the bike, landed on his yeah. side. And yeah. then, uh, you know, he's done his fair share of flares, too. We went and built this little like DIY thing just out of all this like old shitty plywood that yeah. was basically thrown against a fence. And when I say built, that's like the most ridiculous <laughs> shit ever, considering that we forgot to bring screws. We literally brought everything. <laughs> we had three screws to build the thing. So we like start positioning all the wood and then we yeah. put our screws in. First one goes and all of them just break like off <laughs> impact. Right. So we're like, well, OK, yeah, we're just going to keep going. But uh, dude, flares are such an incredible trick. And I wish that I could do them. I got to get to a foam pit and learn them. It's a it's a must for me. It, once you get it figured out, you don't really lose it. Right. You, like you, you can always adjust within it. You can start figuring out how to go higher, how to stay in a certain spot. But once you get it, there's really, honestly, through riding as long as I've ridden, doing the tricks that I've done, there's nothing like that feeling. And that's one of those feelings outside of like the standard for me, a foot jam. I want to be able to do as long as physically possible. The, the idea in my head now is to do a flare every year until i cannot physically do it anymore dude you're <laughs> gonna be like 85 doing <laughs> flares <laughs> that's that's the plan because like at this point i know every bit of how the feeling is because like a lot of people get to a point where it's like on a certain quarter they know like i just know what it feels like for that motion of the uh and it just it does the work like i don't yeah. think of it anymore i like i barely even look where i'm trying to let it's just it's a it's a pure feeling Hell yeah, man. I'm the same way with 360s where I just love that trick. You know, I can pretty yeah. much do them anywhere. I would love to be able to do them down like bigger stair sets and whatnot. Yeah. But uh, I think I've done my fair share of big 360s. I 360 <laughs> over a person's car out of the, like the local <laughs> bowl, you know? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, dude. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite tricks. It's, it's the same thing, right? Where you just drop in, go fast and just kind of like, you know, slowly rotate and it'll work every go. Mm -hmm. let's jump into some Cirque du Soleil stuff because this was one of the coolest things I think that BMX has experienced in years because outside of our world, we talked about this a little bit, you know, with shows, that's really where people are going to see a majority of BMX or, you know, maybe if they go to the skate park, but uh, to see it in the circus is a whole other thing. And the ramp setup and everything about this was just so cool. I think they did such a great <laughs> job. And you guys' as riders were amazing. And I think the choice of riders was uh, the perfect choice, you know? Everybody that was picked was such a great example for BMX, you know? Yeah, yeah. Definitely. So, you know, talking about Cirque du Soleil, for people who maybe have not seen the show or seen anything about it, 
basically the ramp setup is this wild triple hip combo thing in the center with a quarter pipe on each side um, after that hip, right? And uh, I'm going to play some of the footage because I found some on YouTube. Perfect. But the show starts off with you guys riding a half pipe. And then, you know, the ramp starts to slowly, like, rotate and move. It's <laughs> yeah. one of the coolest things ever. But, uh, <laughs> you know, how did you even get involved with this? Because it's such an interesting idea. Who talked to you about this? And who is really the forefront of making this happen? So one of the initial ways that I got involved was through AJ and I. Um, essentially, one of the Cirque du Soleil, I guess he's a he's a talent talent agent. Um, he went to things like he's an ex pro skier, things like that. He went to a bunch of um, uh, feast events in Montpellier was one of them. He went to the others and like so he started to get to know the people and started questioning and at, and kind of telling them that they're looking to work on certain things. Um, and BMX was one of them. So he kept, uh, he talked to AJ, he talked to a bunch of other people, but AJ was the only one who really like gave it a, a full thought essentially. Um, and so what happened was they did it with Cirque, they do additional initial creation period type of things where they come up with concepts, ideas that could make sense, that could work physically on stage. Um, and so AJ was supposed to go do a sit down with them. He couldn't make it. So for him, the next best thing was who else is local in Canada that would have the knowledge and the ability to go talk to them and, and give them an idea. And that's where I came in. And so I went in to a, a meeting to talk about what could physically work on their stage and what could physically happen. I still, I didn't know much about Cirque in general. I had done one other thing with Cirque. It was for um, their other company. They have a, they had at the time, I don't know if it's going to exist again, but anyways, they had a like a smaller company that was working on events only. So it didn't have to do with the, it never has said Cirque du Soleil. It would, it would say something like Cirque du Soleil presents something. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyways, we went in, kind of workshopped ideas. And the two guys that we ended up meeting there, or that I ended up meeting there, were um, the same guys who build all the ramps for Danny McCaskill and Chris Kyle over from Scotland. Yeah, the vision ramps guys. And so that's when I also learned where they kind of got the ideas for some of the things that they thought could work was from Kaleidoscope. They thought of like that kind of type of concept that could go on stage because it would look amazing, you know? Yeah. Um, so as we sat there, we're kind of coming up with ideas. We knew obviously we wanted something with a box jump because obviously box jumps where you're going to get your biggest tricks going. Um, but looking at the size of the stage and how things would work and wanting to have many people riding like at once as well, because that that gives that other that flair, you know, it's like one guy doing one thing looks amazing. Don't get me wrong. But two dudes jumping at the same time, it's kind of like the crowd is just like, what is going on? Right. Uh, so we came up with this idea of a three way hip two eight foot quarter pipes in the back, six foot tall hip in the front, six foot tall ramp. And then. Our initial idea was the curve wall ride, like a, a set, not a full curve, but like a semi angled curve wall ride that would actually sit out over top of the crowd. So as we would curve wall ride, the crowd could just like the people who paid the good money to sit in the front could literally watch dudes come over their heads. And that was the initial idea. Obviously, things got changed a bit because some things just won't physically work. And the uh, the stage itself is like it's limited in space it is right. a tight setup so that was my initial uh kind of sit down with them and then we did what we call as the original workshop where we had seven guys come in uh everybody who got involved with the show they were part of it also Corey walsh was in it <laughs> wow enough, didn't he, know that yeah he, yeah he was part of the initial like he never got into show setting but he was part of the initial workshop and that's where they come up they build everything that kind of would be what's going to be on stage and then you come up with ideas that could work right so all we did that for a week straight we just kept like all right could five guys drop in all at the same time kind of follow each other in a train could two guys hit the hips at the same time and then get to the wall ride together could three guys you know three-way hip type of thing like is this all safe to do right yeah definitely and i think the main thing here is that uh when it comes to these like shows right there's so much going on 
all at once. And when you've got four or five guys riding the same ramp setup together, you really do have to have all of this stuff planned out and figured out. It's not like you guys went off the whim and were like, oh, yeah, I'm going to flip whip this hip, you know, midway through the run. It's all very, very planned from what I know. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's and I, you really you become very trusting of the people that you're with, and you have to trust them to a point because any little slip up, like you imagine, three of us jump the hip at once. If one guy jumps it the wrong way, or you know, it's oh my it's, god, it's catastrophic. It's really catastrophic. And we we had thankfully no real incidents of anything bad happen. We had one crash with me one time with another dude. He was uh he came in to help out. He subbed. And he ended up just like going one wrong way. And we just, thankfully it wasn't in the air. It was all on the ground. Still sucked no matter what. Yeah. But um, yeah, so like we really end up having to trust each other way beyond a normal riding situation. Yeah, definitely. So when this crash happened, was this during a uh, a performance? Yeah, it was. Oh my God. So how do you guys <laughs> deal with that? Because obviously when it comes to, I don't know, whenever it comes to music, right? People will always tell you, just pretend it didn't happen and it's fine, yeah. right? If you make a big deal yeah. about it, people will notice it. Yeah. That's not the uh, same way in BMX. No, for us. So it's, it's all dependent on, especially for the, the type of crash stuff Like crashes has happened in the show. Um, and they will always happen. You know, it's, it's we're not perfect. We're not robots. Yeah. Right. Um, so it's all dependent on what the crash is for say like that crash we hit. It was kind of like, a, oh, shit, what do we do? And like me being kind of the veteran in that specific moment, I just kept doing what I knew to do. I told him to just like move along, get out of the way type thing. And I just kept moving along for what I knew the part of the show we were in. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Like you say, it's kind of it's it's like of a just push it to the side. Nobody will really notice. But if it's like if it's a prop for like somebody's down, we're going to do what we call throwing up an X and we're going to stop the show. Stop it dead to make sure a human being is not sustained an injury that can't physically like I've broken a chain. I just run off stage like I'm like I'm hurt, but I'm not hurt enough to make the show stop. Yeah. Type of thing. Yeah. I was going to say what uh, obviously. I don't think you guys really had too many incidents like that, though. You had mentioned that realistically the only crash you had was one crash. Yeah, we had, I think, two specific crashes of each other crashing into one another. We've had a couple of, you know, mishaps like a, a slip foot, so slide out or like slide out on the ramp, but always to a point where it's like you just slide out, but you're not hurt and somebody gets out of the way. We've had a couple of like serious injuries, like broken ankle uh other stuff like that where we have to like hey we have to stop right now you know but nothing surprisingly for the amount of shows we did because we did well over a thousand shows and there was not that much that happened thankfully wild dude yeah so who broke their ankle if you don't mind me asking uh it was aj actually oh really that's uh yeah. that's wild so obviously yeah. you know you got to stop the show how do things go from there once he's off the stage and kind of dealt with do you guys just go back to what you're doing or it just stops so the performance usually for us because we are the last act in the show it kind of comes down to if something happens in our act it's just a matter of kind of clearing things and then the crowd or the the rest of the artists would come out on stage and we just do our our final salute our wave to the crowd yeah yeah, yeah that it's usually makes not sense. a matter of uh, of like oh let's start from this but like normally it's just because also when it happens it's kind of like our segment is not that long so it's like if something happens well you're not just going to try and start again like it's the moment it's happened okay we're clearing and now we go to the next thing yeah it's uh it's wild to think about right the whole time that we've been talking about this this has just been playing in the background and it's yeah. actually a nine minute long performance this is from yeah. the final show in montreal i don't know if you would yeah. uh, specifically remember that but yep dude incredible right i watched uh i think it was the like full length performance of everything and okay. there's a dude who does some flatland riding in there as well yeah. i'm kind of forgetting his name but uh incredible Talk hero man. at that time yeah yeah dude these are uh these clips and this footage of this is just so insane i would love to have been able to go to this and like how long have you guys been doing this because obviously this was back in 2017 you kind of started this right yeah so officially for me i actually i started the original show funny enough like even another part of the backstory i did that workshop with uh with cirque 
And then what ended up happening is they asked me if I'd actually like to do the show. And so when you get asked for something like that, you have six months of creation, which means you then move to Montreal into a building that's right across from Cirque headquarters. And I learned about certain parts of that that I wouldn't be okay with. And so essentially I had told Cirque to fuck off. Right. I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Fuck that. That's like, you literally want me to work for free essentially and build you out a show. So I was like, no, thanks. And I told him to fuck off. So they ended up getting uh, Ryan Guzman from Ontario. They got Joel Bondu from Quebec here. Uh, Jeffrey Wale from Quebec, Kevin Fabreg from Quebec and then AJ. So that was their initial five guys. They're the ones who went through everything. Um, what ended up happening is because they had done that six months of intense, like they, they literally went to school again. They yeah. essentially went to the clown school and everything and like literal circ school, stuff that a BMX rider never goes through. They learned how to put their own makeup on and everything. Like it's a, it's a whole new world. And because they were in that for that six months straight and through, uh, for the Canadians, it was whatever, it's a, a winter. But AJ was like, coming from being in a full Quebec winter, it was just like, man, we need to like, just unleash one time before we officially start the show. So they all went to Toronto Jam. Um, and it's the year, is it the year that I did Whip Foof? It is, yeah, yeah it 2017. Is. Yeah. yeah, it's the year I did Whip Foof. So actually, funny enough, in the Whip Foof clip, Kevin Fabreg is the one dude holding the rail for me. Yeah. So they were all there. Um, and Joel ended up, I don't know if you remember, he tried to air that, that whatever, nine, eight, nine foot court. He tried to air it as physically high as he could. Yeah, and he he, like, he ended up getting kind of hurt, didn't he? Yeah, he he got he had to eject from whatever twelve feet up straight down, and he ended up blowing up his foot real bad. Yeah, and so they all got back, and like a lot of them were kind of beaten, battered because they took it as their last opportunity to, to like go out and do a contest. Because like once you're signed into something like that, you can't just be going out there and doing contests and everything. Obviously, you're you're signed to do this show every night. Yeah, so he got hurt. And lo and behold, my ass goes back to school that week after. And I get a, a message from AJ going, yo, we need you. I'm like, well, what do you mean you need me? He's like, dude, Joel's foot is fucked. And you're the, like, there's nobody else that knows this and knows this within a two week time period to get here and get into show condition. Right. And so he kind of did all that explanation of how uh, it worked and how it was different than from what they had just dealt with. And that's when I was like, kind of at a point in my schooling too, where I was like, I had just done four straight semesters, no summer off. So I was over that. Yeah. And when he explained what happened, I was like, all right, let's do this. And so then boom, that was my initial in as well. So that's kind of like another piece of the puzzle that like, sometimes I forget that like, oh yeah, I didn't do all the first, first part, but I was there day one first show in Montreal all the way until they finished the Canadian segment. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, it's so wild to think about just how much you guys were dealing with. Like you mentioned, you know, you guys have to put on your own makeup. You have to kind of come up with the performance and whatnot. Yeah. Now, this is an interesting question. Obviously, you know, you're doing well over a thousand shows, you said. And uh, yeah, within that, do you guys keep the same run, the same tricks and the same thing every night? Or is runs, there any variations? Runs mostly. Yes. Because obviously you can't just tweak that too much. I mean, what ended up happening long term is five riders was not sustainable. Right. Because if one guy got hurt, now you're down to a four four version. So you have to rebuild for four version. Another guy say gets hurt in that four version, you have three guys left on stage. That's a not okay thing, right? You're not creating the same show. Um, so while we were in Montreal, AJ went down with that broken ankle. He was out for six months. Oh my uh, God. Yeah. Ryan, Ryan went down. He, he crashed out of flare, went way too high case. He went down for, it was only, I don't know, maybe a month two. Joel's out. Cause I'm already his first replacement. So we already had two new guys come in as replacements and over, I think it was almost a year. It went on where it was like, kind of like five guys are the original and a new coach came in. It was like, look, we need a six guy. There's always got to be a rotated guy out. So one day a week, you get that extra little time off and yeah. then that's what that's what changed that's what changed what could happen in show so trick wise you could always do what you wanted 
obviously there was moments that kind of like flare over under each other that like that just always happened because that looked good so we kept right. that made sure of that but if you didn't want to do a triple whip one day and you just wanted to double whip like nobody's gonna yell at you for doing a double whip right um but then so patterns is what we ended up calling it and everything has a name every specific way and so if let's say i'm in that night and max is out well we're gonna do run this version because that's the version that makes sense with me in the next night say a guy who spins right like kevin is out well we're gonna run a slightly different version because kev's out so now we got to switch some people and so what ended up happening is initially me being the original um excuse me the original sub guy I learned kind of all positions so I could just move around real easily. But now it's come to a point where between the six of us, we all pretty much can do, if not all of it, at least three to four spots each. So whatever scenario might happen, we are always prepared for somebody to be able to keep it going and keep it in a proper show setting. Dude, that is so crazy. There's so much <laughs> that goes into that, right? Like there, it's yeah. so different from just going to your local park and doing your run. Like this is, <laughs> yeah, it's. Yeah, there's a lot of thought process. And so initially there's also like a, you kind of break it down as there's a coach, somebody who kind of like, um, not just the coach of all the artists, but an artist coach. So somebody within the own crew that knows more and is more prepared for it because he actually like writes down about it. He talks to coaching about what could happen. Um, so initially Jeffrey was that person for us. And then just before everything kind of had moved the way it is with the, the virus and stuff, I had become the new primary BMX coach for us. So I was taking in a whole bunch of new knowledge of like being prepared for what could happen in any type of situation. Cause just being the rider, sometimes you, you only worried about making sure to ride and that's fine. That's that's great for you. But there, there has to be one person that maybe is more level headed on the stage at the time for like, let's say a crash happens and you need to say, no, stop now. Or there's water on the stage like, hey, stop riding, boys, because some people everybody has a different feeling about everything. Right. So you got to have that one person who's going to help everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I could totally see why that's so important. Right. That plays a yeah. big role in the show. And uh, yeah. You know, obviously you had mentioned a little bit about moving around with uh, the show and I wasn't 100% yeah. sure how well this worked out, mainly because it seems like there's so much to be bringing with you. But obviously a circus <laughs> is just the thing that, you know, you travel with it. You have to, right? People aren't going to come to you most times. a lot of stuff. Yeah. A lot of stuff. Like just between the BMX dudes, we have like a crate, like, uh, sorry, six crates. They're on wheels. They're, you know... Yay ish. No, nah, bigger than that. Probably about, let's say, five by five ish. Mm -hmm. And so, like, each one of those boxes is for just like mine is my box. Jeff has his, Kev has his. And that's just to move our BMX gear to the next stop. And so, you can imagine just between us five, there's nearly 50 other artists that have their own stuff. There's all of the site crew stuff uh, because we obviously we have a full running wood shop we have a full running everything because we are a literal almost self-contained little community in a way yeah so yeah it's it's a big there is a ton of giant trucks that are just filled to the brim with stuff that's moving around Dude, that's so wild so you had mentioned <laughs> you had mentioned earlier that uh you kind of got your own Cirque du Soleil bike and uh how does that work out because I know that Jeff had a very similar styled bike to you where you both had the kind of teal frames chrome parts who decides what the bikes look like right so initially they had to sit down about something like that that was before my time originally um funny enough mine and Jeff's bikes were two different colors but under the light 100% the same thing yeah I was gonna say in the show but they looked the exact same they they were identical mine was a teal and his was actually a baby blue Okay. That, the way that light hit, it really was an identical bike. Uh, and so initially that came down to like creative stuff. So like outside of just us, there's the artistic team that looks at things and wants it to look a certain way. Um, and so first of all, the chrome parts, they just pop under light. Mm -hmm. so that was one of the first reasons for wanting chrome. Um, and then the colors, originally all the frames were custom built frames by a company called Reclamation at the time. They were out of Colorado. It was one of AJ's sponsors. Yep. Um, and so they got all the frames based on like 
the colors of what we wear on our, our pants and our shirts, the, the free spirit colors is what they're called. So a lot of that is like Kevin's bike was yellow, Jeff's was blue, mine and Joelle's because we were like one unit at the time was green. AJ had an orange bike, Ryan had a pink, like it all had to do with colors of that free spirited type of flag, you know, yeah. the flag we fly in the show. And so that's where it initially came from. Now it's kind of, kind of broken down less about what the bikes look because really the bikes are moving so fast sometimes it's like you can't really tell what what's out there what anybody's riding right we still try to keep a lot of chrome and stuff because it will pop more 100 yeah. percent of the time so but like my most recent bike there's more black parts on it because i just like the way it looks yeah i was gonna say like you know obviously you must be getting these bikes paid for by Cirque du Soleil these aren't coming out of your pocket so are they very weird about you riding it outside of that time or are they perfectly fine with that? Initially, yes. And then we had some recent stuff that kind of caused a little bit of an issue because normally 100% of the time back in the day, at any point before us coming in, like people are not even allowed really to train outside of like what what the coaches know, right? Because yep. like I said, it's a job that involves you needing to be there six days out of the week. So they have to make sure you stay at a first of all, a certain level, but also a certain fitness, a certain health, right? So, but that was really hard as BMX. We only got an hour a week to practice on stage. Yeah. So that's like, it's not, and there's, there's six of us on that setup. You can't really ride multiple dudes at once. So it's, you get nearly six minutes of riding a week and you want like to have us to keep staying at a certain level, like we had to keep riding. So initially the boys had come up with something before I'd ever joined to be able to ride outdoor parks. Right. And so that, that made sure we can keep doing our thing. It got to a point where it was just kind of a spoken word. And then it kind of went through the grapevine. and was like, Hey, the boys can't do this. Cause like they're not covered under their insurance and stuff anymore. Um, and so that became a, a little bit of a deal that we had to figure out because I mean, obviously we can't just, sit there and do an hour a week like we're just we're not going to stay at the level that you want us to stay at if we can't keep riding bmx right so it, it i mean i don't know how things will be once stuff starts up again we'll probably have to go through some of these conversations one more time to really explain like look we have to keep at it if we're not at it then i mean you can't expect us to be at the level that we need to be at yeah it's one of those things that within bmx it's kind of uh it's a known thing that three, four times a week is typically the perfect amount, right? Like yeah, it yeah. gives you some time to rest, but you should be out pretty much every other day trying to improve, yeah. especially yeah. at something like your level, right? And when mm -hmm. you're doing the same runs every night, you know, I feel like there's got to be some sort of fatigue or something going yeah. on there where like... Oh, there, there's yeah. a mental fatigue for sure, because like you say, you're doing the same sort of stuff each time that like not even the trick changing sometimes makes it any different. You're just like, it's the same... I have to drop at this time. So like, don't matter if I do a tail whip, a tuck no hand or a bar spin right now. It's like, I just had to do that. And so you, you get into that, that mindset of just like the sameness, that monotony of it, you know? And so like another reason for us just being able to ride outdoors is just to go do something else, just to go do a, a double peg grind, you know? Cause in the show, we don't ride pegs and we cannot ride pegs because we don't want to mess up all the ramps. So like somebody like me who came from a super technical type of, peggy background i'm like i can't wait to go ride outdoors just to put my pegs on <laughs> yeah absolutely you know we've talked quite a bit about Cirque du Soleil so if there's anything else you really feel is important please tell us a little bit you know well i mean i don't know that there's anything important i'm praying fingers crossed that you know once we get more idea about this whole vaccination stuff we get back to being able to perform again right because obviously with what happened with the pandemic Cirque is an entertainment company entertainment has stopped yeah so that really that put us into a whole new world of hurt as entertainers and as an entertainment company i don't know if you know but Cirque went actually bankrupt like they they have folded as a company they are coming back out of it they have new investors People obviously want Cirque to exist again. The Cirque is not going away, but as a as an original, like what it was before pandemic, it was like that has now changed, right? So we are all very excited for what the future holds. And like, obviously we still have some time to wait on it, but most of us are just really excited to get back and to perform again. Because like you say, there's that one thing in just a regular show that shows kids and, and an audience in front of us 
but then there's our show that really pushes it to a whole new mass, right? Yeah, I was going to mention at the end here that just uh, it's unfortunate, but the show has not been able to continue on, obviously, with things going on. And uh, for some reason, I thought I had heard a rumor about them taking the show out completely, but I guess I was wrong about that. Um, the whole idea, all of that stuff still is there is shows that will stop existing. Right. They've already already had to close shop to pr- full show that they know will not come back. But at the moment, my show has not been said it will not come back. So at the moment, it's coming back. Who knows when? Who knows if it will eventually long term? But this is all stuff that they still have to figure out. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, if you guys are doing a show around here, once things are, you know, back (laughs) and better, I will 100% be there, man. I'm excited to see it. That'd be sweet. I mean, our show will definitely not be in this market anymore because we've done it. Right. Which is how Cirque kind of runs. They don't rerun a big top like our show is called a big top because it's actually in a tent yep uh they don't they don't rerun that in that spot but there was a show being worked on in montreal and so it normally goes montreal ottawa toronto is like the way shows run and start yeah so there is that one that's supposed to start up again again who knows yeah we'll see eh yeah yeah, definitely, man. All that stuff sounds incredible, and I'm so happy that uh, we were able to kind of pick your brain on this and hear about everything that goes on because it was such an interesting part of BMX for a, a little while there, and I'm really excited for it to come back. Me too, me too. Definitely. Anyways, you know, we got to go back on some of the other stuff here that uh, is truly Stephen Moxley. So <laughs> is the foot jam still your favorite trick these days? 100%. Between the foot jam and the flare... Foot jam will have a variation of foot jam whips in there, but it's still a foot jam. 100% foot jam, flare, the other day I die on a BMX. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, I feel like everybody's got a certain trick that's just their favorite that they have to continue on doing for however long they can, right? Yeah. Yeah, man. Foot jam and uh, all those foot jam combos too. There's awesome footage of you doing like 360 whip to foot jam whip on like a lip that stuff's incredible man it's hard to (laughs) even like figure out you know it is it's a lot going on i mean that's always been my favorite part about bikes like i enjoy obviously like i said i I start to jump and things like that that's fun but the technical aspect of trying to do like say three things at once and making it work it's always been my favorite thing i just i guess i've always liked that tinkering kind of side of bmx yeah definitely um another one here so if you could bring back any features from joyride 150 at any time what would one of those features be for me i always really wanted to ride the uh spine step up thing they had in the park room i just i think i went to joyride once while that was there and i was (laughs) not good enough to ride that stuff yet i don't know why but i feel like that would be a really cool feature that funny enough when when I read your question about that, I was like, that's probably one of my things I would bring back. It was such a such a weird obstacle, but like it was a sub box. It was a, a, a step up. It was a spine in a way. Like it was kind of the one of the most unique fun things. That 100% or before obviously Drew B's box, there was a little like satellite dish kind of in and out thing. Yeah. That, that one of those two things. Cause like the, the sub box slash spiny thing that was like it took some effort you had to make sure you wanted to ride where the the bowl or the sorry the the in and out was just kind of like that that fun thing you could just goof around on it. you can go you jump over the whole thing jump into it fake it. like it had so many random options you know so that thing was always real fun yeah definitely dude i feel like i probably hit that once or twice when i first started riding and i regret not trying to ride it for longer <laughs> because uh it definitely seemed like a really cool feature you know yeah yeah, it was super fun. Just so, just a weird thing. And at the time, because Joy I was still new and stuff, and they had the whole box rhythm section, like we didn't need a box jump in the skate park. So it felt awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think uh, nowadays the park section in there has changed so much that uh, if you're not a local, I feel like it's impossible <laughs> to ride, right? Like I can 100%. sort of ride that stuff. But uh, even just a few years ago, I preferred their setup then, right? It's just, yeah. it's so packed with ramps where like you can't ride 15 feet in a straight line without having to hit something, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Like you, you have to be ready right away. It's like boom, boom, boom. And like, that's always been kind of like my favorite type of riding. I've always enjoyed that. The whole like 
hit it, hit it, hit it. You know, it's, it's probably why I love tech the way it is. Cause it's all like, it's quickness, right? I've yeah. always liked to, can I think super fast on my feet, you know? And it's definitely a very important part of riding and I'm happy that it exists. It's just one, one of those things that, you know, for me personally, <laughs> I wish things were a little bit more spread out, but dude, look at yeah. the way that the riders around there are right. It breeds some incredible yeah. talent. Like there's this it's kid, insane. there's this kid, Ben, who's been riding for so <laughs> long. He's like 15 and that kid has a list on his phone of like everything <laughs> he wants to do that day. And uh, <laughs> dude, insane, right? Another joyride rider yeah. right there. Little Ben Weber Kramer. I saw him this summer actually, cause I had gotten up one time to get out and ride Vargas and Drew's and he was there and it was weird just cause I hadn't seen him in a couple of years from being away on tour. And he's grown like just in my head, he was always that little kind of snot nosed kid from joyride. Yeah. Still a really good rider then, but now it's just like, He's grown two feet and he's doing much bigger tricks. And it's like, holy shit, dude, who are you? And where was the kid I left? <laughs> yeah, dude. He's one of those guys that I'm going to have on at some point. It would be really cool oh, to just you... chat with him. <laughs> I can't wait to listen to that. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's always interesting to talk to some of the younger kids, right? I'm only 24, but like, yeah. dude, some of the kids out there nowadays are just so unreal <laughs> on a bike where it's like, you're like 14. How, dude? Yeah, there's a right? girl. Exactly. But. Sorry. That's what we talked about earlier was like the, the innovation and the technology that has hit, right? It's like, it's changed what somebody can do. Somebody, especially so small uh, at his age, he wouldn't have been able to ride at all. Like when we, when I started, you know, because the bike was just physically too big and too heavy for him. Yeah, definitely. There's a girl, I believe in Mississauga who is like 11 years old and going to the Olympics right now for skateboarding. And that's wild to think about, right? Like these young yeah. kids are going to be a big part of the future of uh, action Absolutely. sports. Absolutely. Definitely. Anyways, let's see here. So we talked a little bit about the uh, backyard setup that Eric Favitt had. I feel like I maybe pronounced his name wrong, but that's no, okay. No, that's right. Eric Dude. Favitt. Yes, there we go. I always <laughs> pronounce people's last names wrong. So to get it right on the first go, it's pretty rad. Um, good. but anyways, you actually did quite a lot of ramp building, uh, throughout your time in BMX. Obviously you helped Jordan out with, uh, Epic bike park when that was a thing. Yep. And I yep. feel like you probably helped out a little bit with, uh, the yard in Ottawa at some point. N no, I didn't because okay. I was gone. I right. would have been involved. I, I like, I popped in to see Jordan when he was initially like doing some of the starts, but I was just going on tour with Cirque. If that not, makes obviously. Sense, yeah my my tools would have been around my belt and uh i would have been in there with him so when did you first get into ramp building and how seriously did you take it you know was it always just something that you enjoy but you didn't really know how much you could do with it or for me ramp building probably started like 2012 2013 it was with crazy crew like yeah. the stunt team because sometimes we would do things like we'd we'd gone to t texas and we didn't want to bring a certain amount of stuff so we ended up buying wood and building ramps there. I didn't know much about it. We had our, our guy at the time, Ben Kaufman, he, he had everything figured out. All I did was, you know, throw screws in, throw a nail in, make sure that, you know, it was solid. Um, and then after that, Jordan came to me with the idea of like, hey, you want to build this, this park with me? I'm like, what do you mean build a park? Like, like uh, I guess. So we went in and did that. And that's once we built Epic, that's when I started to learn a little bit more about it. You know, I'd, I'd always worked um, construction and things like that beforehand with my dad, and my brother. So I had a knowledge to a point, but I still don't, don't get me wrong. I still don't know, know too much about how a transition is measured out or anything, but I know when a transition's riding right or looks right from just like that view now. And so ever since then, it was like, if I wasn't, on the road doing something or anything like that and jordan had some job he normally would say hey mox what are you doing you want to go build a ramp i'm like hey if i got the free time i'm i'm all about it because it's it is really fun to do now i never thought i would enjoy it the way i actually do when we build it i'm no jordan i don't get like locked in there and want it done instantly but i i really enjoy that process and then afterwards i mean you never get mad when you get to ride something right 
Definitely, man. My first experience really ramp building was like so long ago, you know, a buddy and I had built this crappy little quarter pipe and then I just didn't build ramps for years. Right. Unless it was like dirt jumps. And then uh, randomly just met Jordan and would help. Like I helped with the uh, the bullet all in. I helped throughout literally the entire project. Right. And just like watching him build was ridiculous because he would only be able to come in on the weekends and he would work yeah. from like 8 a.m. till 3.34 in the morning and then yeah. like right back to it the next day. Same thing. Goddamn you know? machine. Goddamn yeah. machine. Wild. He's definitely uh, an inspiring ramp builder when like yeah. you see that kind of stuff. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say, like, obviously, working alongside him, you've got to learn a lot. Have you figured out how to do bull corners or anything yet? Probably not, because you had mentioned no. you don't really know much about the no, transition. He, he's still that guy, you know? Like, I mean, I've always been that. I felt like, especially when we had, say, Epic, because he gets so zoned in to what he's doing, you know? And, like, something like Epic, he was the, he was the main builder on it. I think I've always been able to help be that that secondary that assistant for him to like take care of the other bullshit that like he needs to really work on that bowl corner you know like i'll go i'll go frame up this fucking box jump or this quarter pipe get it all done get the easy shit together that like you know it's mindless for him to put together and he can work on that hard shit and i i think that's why we always worked out really well together definitely right and even when i was building the bowl with him it was a lot similar to that right where he literally was like all right i'm going to cut all the transitions and you guys are just going to frame them up like i'll literally put a line on here and you just (laughs) got to match it up you know and that's it yeah Yeah, Yeah. it's uh it works real well when you do it that way that's for sure exactly exactly like i i've learned a little you know now again i haven't worked on any ramps in a little bit so i'd probably be a bit rusty but i i I gathered a few tips and tricks about making things a little speedier, you know, but like I said, when it came to the the transitions, how a corner worked, that, that was always him. It's like, you do that. I ain't trying to try and figure that all out. And then if it doesn't work, I'm going to get mad at it. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. He's uh, he's very patient when he comes to that stuff, right? He works so hard, man. Yes, sir. Anyways, at this point in the show, we typically do some fan questions. So, uh, well, let's jump into these. Jacob says, what's your tire preference? Uh, Actual tire? Like what, what tire I ride, I guess? Yeah. Uh, I mean, right now I've been riding Max's tires. The uh, I think they're the Grifters. Nice. Yeah, those kinda have like, been a classic. Yeah, they kind of like, I never rode them before I worked for Cirque, obviously. They have a little bit of this on them. Yeah. Um, and so I, I normally ran like a, like a demo tire before, a demolition tire. Cause it was kind of like, it hit that sweet spot of being light, but also kind of would last a shit ton of time because being a semi broke BMX rider, you're like, I don't want to be spending all this money on tires. Right. Yeah. And being, being that I was a rider who rode everything, I was like, well, if I go feeble grind a ledge, I don't want my tire to blow up. So I was kind of like, there was a moment where K cheese first came out. I had those on my bike when I was a lot younger, it made your bike so light that like learning tricks was way easier. But as I grew into things and, you know, bikes also got lighter and I got stronger, it was like, ah, I need something with more durability. So, yeah, but now I'm riding Maxxis. And I mean, at this moment, I couldn't see myself putting anything else on. Yeah, dude. Are they the foldable ones? Yeah, they are the foldable ones. Yeah, dude. I got my first set of folding tires this year and uh, I love them, man. They're great. (laughs) I'm riding the Eclat ones, but uh, yeah, they're sick. Yeah, for us, I mean, obviously we do so many shows and we ride so often too that having a light bike not only just makes certain tricks easier, but just the fatigue of riding as much as we do, it's like you really want to try and do anything you can in in a way that's not going to be detrimental to your riding, right? Yeah, absolutely. I could fully see that, right? There's a lot yeah. that goes into that. Yeah, exactly. Um, another one here coming from a fan. Uh, if you could start all over again, would you still ride the same way? <laughs> that comes from my girlfriend. Oh, interesting. <laughs> uh, I think I would. I, I mean, I don't wish to ride like any other person. I don't wish to change how I started riding. There's probably moments in my riding career that could have been different. I could have you know, chosen to do that different, but I think it's all part of the experience of what it is. Right. And so I think it also, the rider I have become is based on how I rode. Right. So if I was to change that, maybe I didn't get where I got, maybe I, you know, started trying big, hard, 
jump stuff. And because of that, I ended up getting injured. And then I, I left bike riding, right? Like there's, there's all these variables. So I think the way I approached it was the way that I was meant to approach it. Definitely. I could fully see that, right? I think the experience that you have throughout riding kind of forms the rider that you are. And if you were to start all over again, I feel like things would be completely different because you probably wouldn't yeah. go through those experiences, which are no, so important. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, good friend of mine, hit him with Caleb says first really cool trick you ever learned. So that's an interesting one because I think a trick depends on each person, right? Like something yeah. that you learned, you might feel isn't cool. Whereas I was like, yeah. Oh my God, that's sick. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I, what always comes to mind is my first tail whip. Yeah. And I think that's because especially in the time frame when I learned tail whips, when, you know, bikes were still 30 to 35 pounds, it was a lot harder to do something like a tail whip. Um, but I remember vividly, we were at a riding friend's house. The, the original McNeil DVD had just come out. We watched Ruben's section and he did so many crazy variations with tail whips at the time in that video. And I remember all of us getting real pumped up, but me especially getting like so weirdly pumped up. Like I'd never gotten that specific type of feeling. And I just knew I needed to get to the skate park right away. I was learning tail whips that day no matter what and so we we rolled our asses down to the park and i tried until i'm talking pitch pitch black you could not see anything i just kept trying we had we called it a bowl it's not a bowl it's a it's basically a bank that's yeah. what we rode um and so i just kept tail whipping tail whipping tail whipping couldn't couldn't get my feet there couldn't get my feet there it was getting over getting over and then all of a sudden just one of the times in complete darkness so i still don't know how i landed it it came around, both feet landed on the pedals. And I was like, I did it. And then turned around, did two more in a row. And then like, that was it for the night. I had to go home because it was getting late. My grandma would have been pissed. But yeah. I was just like, that's the one memory I'll never forget learning was just how that happened. Dude, that's incredible. I, <laughs> dude, I took years to learn tail whips, like literally four or five years just trying and trying. And it was one of those tricks that like, I never would just go to the park with the intentions of learning it because I would always get so heartbroken if I did that. Like, yeah. I would try it's, maybe four or five and that was it. It's crazy because that's so many people. They, they're like, hey, how long did it, like when I first initially learned? So how long did it take you to learn? I was like, it took me a day. Like, it just took me a night of just doing it. I don't know. I have a, a semi kind of I need to do something if I think I can personality, you know, like I, yep. I cannot give up. Like, it's like there's there's many tricks you'll see on my Instagram where like sometimes I'll post a couple of the falls and like I spent three hours trying to do one trick because I just knew I could do it and it will work, you know. Um, and so that that's that same thing. And they'd be like, it took me like three months it took me three years to learn to tail whip and i was like yeah i don't once i got it in my mind that i can make it happen that's that's it that's the end of it it's happening dude that's incredible that's uh that's so rad that's such a like bmx determined kind of style and yeah. obviously yeah. right like when you're that kind of person you can bring that to other aspects of life which i'm sure has really helped yeah it has it it for sure has like helped me to push things that I might not have been able to push otherwise, obviously. Yeah. Um, this one comes in from Kyle. He says, favorite concrete park in Ontario. Whew, that one's an interesting one. Because, like, Ontario's funny with the, the concrete parks. There is a lot. I haven't been to a, a ton of them. And I'm trying to think of some of the ones. Because there's all, for, for a while, when I was younger, we would go and just venture to some parks, you know? And like, I only read it, wrote it one time. So it's like hard to say if that would be my favorite, right? Yeah. But one that always sticks out. And I think it always stick out because it was a moment in my career when um started to take off a little bit more and started to become more of like a professional and learn a lot harder tricks. It'd be, it's in Ottawa. It's called Legacy Skate Park. Yeah, that park's incredible. Exactly. And uh, we ended up when we were working for Cirque the couple of years back and we were in the Get Snow, Ottawa area, we got to go ride there a bunch of times. And I re-remembered how much I really loved that park. And it was like, it's funny because at the time coming up, there was guys that lived there that were like heavy into heckling and, and making things like kind of hard for kids. And they were hard on me. But now as I've gotten older and stuff, I appreciate it. It was like, whatever, they were just having a good time, you know, and I'm, I'm friends with them now. But at the time it used to like really frustrate me. And that was kind of like 
a mixed bag of wanting to go there, but I appreciate everything that happened there. And I'll always remember it as somewhere in my BMX career that was like a really strong moment. There was two parks in Ottawa. One wasn't made out of concrete, but that concrete one was super fun. Yeah, I feel like heckling and just kind of shit talking is a big part of BMX, right? Whether you mm -hmm. like it or not, it's important and it happens. And uh, I think nowadays we see a lot more of it on the internet, obviously, with uh, yeah. BMX meme pages and whatnot. We talked to yeah. Charlie Cromlish and he loves them. You know, I do too. <laughs> Rodeo Peanut was one of my favorite things to ever come out of BMX. It's uh, it, it was good. It was real good. Yeah, it's something that's so important, right? And I think that it only makes people want to improve on their riding. Some people aren't a big fan of it. It and that's okay right it depends each person's different but whether yeah. you like it or not shit talking and heckling is a big part <laughs> of bmx it's a it's one thing i will say it's kind of hard sometimes it's like when you're specifically the spotlight of it and like of let's say there's a crew of six guys and they're all heckling you yeah it can get a little frustrating sometimes you know because you're just like oh one dude you can deal with but like five other dudes come on you know and that's something i think kids have it a little easier in a way because most times kids don't heckle each other at the park anymore because they're all afraid of each other, but yeah. online they're, they're all about it, you know? But I mean, for me, you know, I take the phone, I go, okay, the heckling is done. You just put it away. Yeah, but exactly. Before, like when I, I was young and there was no phone to heckle somebody on, it was like, man, can you guys just sh shut the fuck up? Like, leave me alone. I want to do a tail whip and you don't like it. I don't care. Yeah, I, man. I would, I would get worked up when I was younger a lot for sure. <laughs> dude that's a okay man i'm uh i'm the same way there's been definitely my fair share of instances where i've been like just leave me alone you know yeah yeah it's it is what it is but i mean that's kind of part of it you know it's it it helps us grow as people it, it kind of helps us be a little stronger in a way right and it's just mm -hmm. at that moment you don't see it but as you grow older you kind of go oh that wasn't that bad man they they said they didn't like tail up so they called you a robot who cares <laughs> Dude, Scotty Kramer was the perfect fucking BMX robot, you know? There's like, a good clip of him in uh, Road Fools, like yeah, being called the robot from Texas Morgan Wade, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's another example of, uh, funny enough, another person that I had looked up to at the time because, I mean, we didn't, I didn't get to look up as much because, you know, he's only a year older than I am. But when he was coming up, it was like, man, he was doing things that were outside of the box. And I looked at it as like, oh, man, that shit's crazy, like, I wonder if I could figure out some form of that. And that's, I think, where the tire tap tail whip stuff came from Scotty when he used to ride for felt and did all sorts of weird shit. Wall ride to whip on a flat wall. It was just like nobody was doing that, right? So I always looked at that as like super creative and a, a way of like experiencing BMX slightly different. Definitely, man. Scotty's one of my biggest inspirations. And anybody who's listened to this show knows that, right? Scotty mm. is such a huge inspiration for me and an influence in so many ways and uh even before his crash right like his riding yeah. and just how determined he is as a person is incredible yeah exactly yeah um another one from kyle he says is it true that you learned a lot of your tech trick combos in a garage with a flat ledge uh no flat ledge but in a garage most of the things i figured out was yes because uh where i had lived there was Originally, there was a park, and then we moved to a new town, and the park there was atrocious. Mm -hmm. It was literally, you you were probably better off not riding the park. Like, the the four-foot quarter had three foot of vert on it. <laughs> <laughs> it was pure concrete, just like, ah, oh, just a horrendous park, you know, just built with no idea of what was going on. But, I mean, it wasn't built for BMX. I don't even think it was built for skating. It was just built to be built, right? Yeah. Um, so, a lot of what I had done is I figured if I could do it on flat ground, imagine how easy a ramp would make it. So like a tire tap to tail whip on flat is hard, but if you could do it on flat, if you had a five foot quarter, you wouldn't even have to try really hard. Yeah. Yeah, dude, so that I, actually makes a lot of sense. It, it, and it did for me. I mean, it was at a time where bikes weren't as light as they are now. So it kind of made things harder still, but I, I always looked at it as like the, the idea of a trick and, and thinking about it in your brain is one thing, the physical part of doing it is another and the and the actual third part for me is doing it on a ramp because doing a foot whip on flat ground is roughly the exact same thing as doing it on a ramp i know there's not that jump in feeling but to get the idea of the basic of what's happening the physics of the actual trick if you have that already memorized 
the, the hardest part now of doing it on a ramp is just getting back into the ramp. And most kids, they, they, have, they don't really look at it that way. It's just like, I'll just try and figure out the trick now. But it's like, if you've already come in semi-prepared, you're 50% done, you just got to finish that last 50%, right? And so I think all of my flat ground bike riding stuff made a whole lot of ramp riding 10 times easier for me. Definitely. And I think a good example of that would be uh, Chris Silva and his ability to be able to do flat ground decades on, you know, a spine shit like that, yeah. where it's like, yeah. you got to learn it on flat ground and then you can take it to a spine and it'll look unreal. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's just, it's just a matter of like pushing a boundary in a way that's like, okay, if somebody doesn't look at flat ground tricks as being like, oh, all that scary or whatever. It's like, fine. But if you could suss it out there, and then bring it somewhere else. It's like, it takes it to a new level, right? Definitely. And uh, Kyle just wanted to add on here. He says all the good sessions with you and the Ontario homies. <laughs> he misses all of them apparently. Yeah, that's awesome. Kyle's awesome. And Kyle was actually, he was, he was a dude. I mean, he is a dude from Sudbury, um, but he was really good friends with a lot of the guys from Ottawa at that time that were giving me a, a lot of shit. Yep. Because they're originally from Sudbury, a lot of them, and they moved to the Ottawa area. So he knew them very well. And I knew him back then, too. And like, I didn't really like him then. But I obviously I love him a lot more now because I've grown as a person and none of that shit really mattered. You know, like we said, it's just it was bullshit back in the day. Yeah, there you go. That's awesome, man. And uh, we have come to the end of our fan questions, which means we Woo. have one last question for you from me, myself, of course. Um, hey, as someone who can be found in the streets, at the park, or even in the circus, what's your advice to everyone on how to make the most of BMX and enjoy all aspects of riding? BMX is what you make of it. That's, that's the, the end all be all in my mind. It's whatever you want it to be, whether you want to jump ramps, whether you want to do ice grinds down six stair rails, like BMX is you and your BMX bike. It doesn't matter what you want to do. You just need to ride because you like riding. If you don't want to ride like that, that is fine. If you do want to ride like that, that is also fine. Find what is fun about bikes for you. Because one of the main reasons you ever got on a bike, not just to get away, because that's what a lot of people started riding for, was just to ride away. It was, it's just fun. So find what you find fun and just do it. Don't worry about anything else because at the end of the day, somebody making fun of you for doing a feeble 180 on a flat ledge has nothing to do with your enjoyment of the, of it. You know, you really have to look at it as like, do I enjoy it? Yes. That's it. That's, that is absolutely it. Enjoy BMX for you. Definitely. That's uh, some great advice. And I fully agree with you on that. Right. Especially about uh, people you know, if you enjoy a certain trick and you want to learn a certain trick just because you enjoy it, go and do it. Don't, you know, not do it because someone else doesn't like it. You know, that's yeah, uh, that's it's, very important. It's individual. As much as we like, we created this whole community of it. Really, at the end of the day, BMX is you. It's you with your bicycle. If you decide to backflip, it's because you decided to backflip, not because Jimmy backflips, you know, like it should have nothing to do with that. If that's the type of person you are, fine, go do that as well. But I just, for me, it's, especially as I've grown in it, you know, I've been riding a long time now. It's almost 20 years of my life has been on two wheels of BMX. And I had to figure out like, dude, if you want to go do a whip foot whip, go do a whip foot whip. If today you want to do a feeble 180, do a fucking feeble 180. And don't worry about anything that anybody else says about it because you did it for you. Definitely, man. That's some great advice, man. Thank you so much for that. No worries. Steven, this has been incredible. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Go Cave podcast. This was uh, really rad. This is the time where we would ask you to shout out anybody that you want to shout out. If you got anybody that's been helping you through everything, you know, give them a, give them a thanks. Uh, shout out to my girlfriend, 100%. Uh, Valerie Chabot. She's one of the, the questions from fan questions. Uh, she, uh, she's had my back since the day we met, essentially. She's got me through a lot of what we've had to deal with over the last year. Without her, I, I have no idea where my brain would be at. So her, 100%. Uh, shout out to all my Cirque, my Cirque buddies. 
not just the BMX riders, but everybody else, but especially shout out to the BMX dudes, Jeffrey, Kevin, Joel, Maxim, AJ. Can't wait to ride with all them again. Shout out to the six tape boys. Really want to come back to Toronto, ride with them. Shout out to every park that has ever let me in and ride. Derek at All In, Mark at Joyride, Gabe at Inflow, you know, shout out to just everybody in Southern Ontario, you know, without all of the people that I've met through this whole time, I mean, I wouldn't be the rider I am and I wouldn't have made it to where I am. So I got nothing but respect for everything. And I, I love being home for that fact. Hell yeah, man. I fully agree with you there. I, I honestly constantly think about how important the Ontario scene is within BMX. And I don't know if it's just because I have a bias since I live here, but I think that Southern Ontario and uh, Montreal, that kind of area altogether yeah. is probably the best scene for BMX in the world, not for pros, but for just the community in general. Absolutely, man. I mean, I've, I've been in it a really long time and it, it's had its ups and downs, but it's like anything, everything has their ups and downs, but it's, it's a strong scene. And like, there's a lot of dudes like me who've been in it a really long time and they're still there. They're still shredding. They're just, they're doing their thing. And that's fucking awesome. Hell yeah, man. Dude, this has been incredible again. Thank you so much. And, uh, I think we're going to end it off here if that's okay with you. Perfect. Awesome. Well, uh, for everybody who's made it this far, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Peace.